federal gun laws. Among the witnesses, the head of the Brady campaign against handgun violence. This is the first hearing on gun laws since the shootings at Virginia Tech. It's about three hours. Committee will come to order. This is a uh, hearing of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. And today's hearing will cover lethal loopholes, deficiencies in state and federal gun purchase laws. And we have uh, three panels today. Uh, and I'll be introducing the first panel in a moment. Uh, today's hearing is going to examine the deficiencies and loopholes in state and federal laws designed to protect individuals who are deemed a risk to commit acts of firearm violence from purchasing guns. Without objection, the uh, chair and ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. And without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. Good afternoon and welcome. The Domestic Policy Subcommittee of Oversight and Government Reform Committee has come to order. I want to recognize the significant contributions of the ranking member of the full committee. This hearing is bipartisan in its conception and in its development. I want to thank the gentleman for his cooperation. Today in America, people who shouldn't get guns get guns. That's simple. Everybody knows that, how they get guns and how to prevent them from getting guns. That's not so simple. And that's why we're here today. This hearing will focus on lethal loopholes and deficiencies in laws designed to prevent high-risk individuals from buying firearms. There are other important reasons why America has such a high rate of gun violence, gang activity, inadequate provision of mental health services, and cultural attitudes towards violence. But those issues are for another day. There are many federal and state laws that have been on the books, some for decades, aimed at preventing certain categories of people from purchasing guns. The problem is that they do not function properly or are not properly enforced. In 1968, when Congress passed the Gun Control Act, it made a judgment that certain categories of individuals, termed prohibited persons, should not be allowed to purchase or possess handguns or long guns because of the high risk that they would later use these firearms to commit crimes. Prohibited persons include convicted felons, illegal aliens, and individuals with serious mental health issues. The problem was that it was difficult to determine which individuals fell into these categories when they walked into a gun dealer to buy a gun. In 1993, Congress passed the Brady Act with the goal of instantly checking a prospective handgun purchaser against a nationwide database that would contain all information necessary to determine if the purchaser was a prohibited person. To the extent the data is in the system, the background check works fairly well. Between 1994 and the end of 2005, federal and state law enforcement performed about 70 million background checks and identified 1,360,000 purchasers in the prohibited categories, a rejection rate of 1.9% and over 90% of prospective purchasers got an instant response. But this is only part of the story, because that system is only as smart as the information we put into it. And a lot of those people the system lets through, we all know should not be allowed to own guns, people like the disturbed young man who took the lives of 33 innocent people last month at Virginia Tech. We will hear testimony from the government that the information in the database, actually three databases, collectively called NICS or NICS, is woefully incomplete. For some prohibited persons categories, there is much less than half of the data that should be there. And about half of the states don't provide the FBI with any mental health data. Much of the information about prohibited persons originates in the states and localities, and they often fail to collect this information. If they do collect it, they don't send it in a usable form to the federal government. Why? Well, after all, that only hurts the states which rely on the data, where illegal gun purchases and gun violence occur. 
Part of it is that the current law does not obligate the states to report this vital information, and it's difficult and expensive to do so. Some states have other policies that get in the way. The result is that 40 years later, 40 years after the passage of the Gun Control Act, individuals who are prone to use guns illegally are still getting guns legally. There is legislation currently being considered by the House Judiciary Committee, H.R. 297, the NICS Improvement Act of 2007, which is designed to remedy the state's reporting failures through a combination of direct funding for improving states' reporting systems, fiscal incentives for states' compliance, and penalties for noncompliance. We'll hear testimony that passage of this law would help reduce illegal firearm purchases, but that the law alone won't be enough. Even if this reporting improves, there remains the gun show loophole, the Brady Act's instant background check only applies to federal licensed firearm dealers and not to private sales, including sales by unlicensed dealers at gun shows. These private sales are largely unregulated, and many guns involved in firearm violence have been traced to gun show sales. Instant background checks are not the only avenue to enforce gun control in the Brady Act. Federal government enforcement is primarily the responsibility of the Bureau of Alcohol, Firearms, Tobacco, and Explosives, the ATF. The ATF can investigate, inspect, and monitor sales of licensed and unlicensed firearm dealers, revoke licenses, or refer for prosecution dealers and purchasers who break the law and work with state and local law enforcement to prevent illegal sales. But there is reason to believe, including government studies, that the ATF does not do its enforcement job well. This hearing will investigate where lax enforcement is a product of the ATF's lack of resources and authority, and where the Bureau simply does not use its authority well. We will also hear how federal law makes it difficult, if not impossible, for state and local law enforcement to get data necessary to trace guns used in crimes back to the gun dealers that illegally sold them. In spite of these limitations, we will learn the unbelievable story of the efforts of New York City to fill the federal enforcement void by suing out of state gun dealers who were the source of guns involved in crimes afflicting New York City. In settling the suit, the federally licensed gun dealers located in Pennsylvania, South Carolina, and as far away as Georgia agreed to a three-year inspection and monitoring regime administered by New York City. I guess necessity really is the mother of invention. It fell upon a city to enforce federal law because the ATF is AW. OL. Kudos to New York City, which has sent its top official in this area to be a witness today. Our third panel will focus on the states. We'll hear testimony on how some states do a better job than others. First, we'll learn about how some states have enacted laws and developed internal systems designed to improve their data collection and reporting. Second, many states have moved into the vacuum of federal regulation and have passed laws regulating non-federally licensed dealers and effectively closed the gun show loophole. And finally, we're going to hear about states that have passed purchase prohibitions beyond those required by federal law, aimed at categories of individuals who have shown propensity for violence, including juvenile offenders and certain misdemeanor and domestic violence offenders. We'll also hear from an advocate for mental health patients who cautions that proposals to broaden the prohibitive categories for people undergoing mental health treatment should be grounded not on prejudice, but on sound science, and that these individuals actually, that these individuals actually pose a risk of violence. Moreover, we hear concerns that these laws will not be crafted to serve as a disincentive to people seeking mental health treatment. It's possible that the state's approaches can reveal uh, some best set of practices that will be adopted by other states or percolate up and become the federal standard. But as with federal purchase restrictions, enforcement of state restrictions depends on other states reporting crucial information. We'll hear about the lack of uniformity and problems of coordination across the states. And Ohio law, for example, prohibiting a certain category of high-risk individuals from buying fire, uh, handguns will not stop individuals who commit disqualifying offenses in other states if those states do not share their information. Finally, we can expect more from the states in a way of reporting, respect their sovereignty, and learn from them. However, because the market for guns is national and state borders are porous for both guns and people, in the end, this is a national problem. It is my hope that this hearing can show the way for the federal and state governments through the implementation of new policy or the passage of new laws 
to close these loopholes and ultimately to reduce firearm violence. At this time, the uh, Chair is pleased to uh, recognize Mr. Davis. Thank you. I want to thank you, Chairman Kucinich, for holding this hearing on an issue of critical importance to the citizens of every state in this nation. The most lethal episode of gun violence by an individual in our history, the shooting last month at Virginia Tech, prompted many to take a critical look at federal and state prohibitions against gun ownership. As a result, Virginia Governor Tim Kaine closed a loophole in the way the Commonwealth processes information on those found to pose a danger to the community. Before, only persons actually admitted to a hospital or residential treatment facility were deemed dangerous enough to be subject to the gun ownership ban. By executive order, the Governor eliminated the inapt distinction in this context between inpatient and outpatient care to require prompt listing of all individuals undergoing involuntary mental health treatment in any setting. In issuing his order, the Governor correctly observed the key factor should be the danger finding and not whether the judicially mandated treatment is performed in an institution or on an outpatient basis. That is what we are here today to discuss, how best to keep guns out of the hands of dangerous individuals. The Gun Control Act of 1968 listed those who were prohibited from purchasing or possessing a firearm. The Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act of 1993 requires that all federally licensed firearms dealers obtain a background check on potential purchasers through the National Instant Check System, the NICS. The NICS contains information from State and Federal agencies about individuals who should not be permitted to purchase a gun. In an ideal world, every time an individual prohibited under law attempts to buy a gun, a quick background check would prevent the purchase. Unfortunately, we don't live in an ideal world. In truth, not every State compiles and maintains an accurate list of those who should not have a gun. If the State's lists are incomplete, the NICS data are also incomplete. And not all guns are sold by licensed dealers. Those gaps make it possible for dangerous people to obtain lethal weapons. We hear a variety of reasons for reporting lapses and delays, from inadequate technology systems to privacy issues to costs. But we all know from sad experience even minor oversights or loopholes can have major and tragic consequences. Some states are moving to expand and strengthen the exclusion criteria for gun purchases. We will discuss some of those proposed standards today, including juvenile offenses, serious misdemeanor convictions, imposition of restraining orders protecting other than spouses or children, and a more expansive list of mental illness diagnoses. We will hear from academics and others who have studied evidence of a predictive connection between these and other factors in subsequent violence. There is no denying this is a complicated issue. Are we willing to include in the mental illness prohibition individuals who voluntarily commit themselves to a mental health institution? Do we tell someone who struggled with mental illness in his or her 20s, received needed treatment, and gone on to live a productive life that he or she cannot buy a gun 20 years later? Will including a broader range of mental health indicators discourage people from seeking treatment? Does the current list of prohibited acts, conditions, and findings capture advances in psychiatric understanding and all known predilections to violence? The process of crafting additional prohibitions and applying them to all gun sales is not easy, and no one has a perfect solution. Hopefully today's hearing will help us better understand the questions and get closer to workable answers. But I would just add that this violence uh, claimed four victims, and plus the shooter, all from Northern Virginia into my home uh, county. Uh, this has affected the whole community, and I appreciate your looking into this, and I appreciate our witnesses being here today. I thank the uh, gentleman from Virginia, the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we all want to keep guns out of the hands of people who would commit crimes of violence. There's no question about that. But we have to be very careful when we start messing around with the Second Amendment. And I know we're not supposed to, we're not going to be covering the Second Amendment today, but I think it's important that we talk about it anyhow. In 1977, here in Washington, D.C., they put, it, they put into law a permanent ban on all handguns and all guns in a person's house. Since 1977, the, the crime rate and the murder rate in this city has gone up triple, over triple, because the criminals know they can come into your house and you can't uh, protect yourself. I had a young lady that was my secretary. She lived on the second floor of, a, of an apartment building about five blocks from the Capitol. A guy shinnied up the drain pipe and came in through a window she had open in the summertime and stabbed her four or five times. She finally got down the stairs, opened the door, and, and uh, she hit him with a pan. That's the only thing she could. She couldn't even have mace in her house. So we have to be very careful about taking away the rights of homeowners and individuals uh, that would allow them to protect themselves from 
these violent criminals. Uh, when I got off the plane, when I first got elected to Congress in, in 1983, the cab driver was driving me down to the Capitol. And I said, tell me about Washington. He says, oh, it's a great city. He said, but the crime rate's terrible. And I said, well, you know, I've got a permit to carry a gun back in Indiana. Maybe I should do it here. He says, oh, you can't get a gun permit. I said, what are you talking about? He says, they don't allow any guns here. The only people who get guns are the police and the crooks. And he reached under his seat and pulled a 38 out and handed up, uh, hold, held it up to me and says, but if you want one, I can get you one in about 15 minutes. So that shows you that the criminals have access to these weapons and they can kill people as well as the people who have these mental problems. And I'm for keeping guns out of the hands of people who are going to be a problem, and we ha but we have to be very, very careful how we do that. I'd like to point out one thing on Virginia Tech. That was a horrible, horrible crime. And we all want to make sure those tragedies don't happen. And we want to make sure that people who have mental problems or have a, have a case history of violence uh, don't get guns. And it's a very tough thing to do. But I'd like to just add one thing to that. If one of those students or one of the people at Virginia Tech had the right to carry a weapon, do you think they might have saved some of those people's lives because they could have retaliated against this guy? As it was, nobody had a way to stop him. They shut doors and he shot through the doors. And so I'd just like to say that uh, obviously we want to keep guns out of the hands of people who would pose a threat to society, but at the same time we ought to realize that uh, uh, keeping law-abiding citizens from having weapons to protect themselves is a big, big mistake. And with that, I yield back my time. I thank the gentleman. I would like to uh, start by introducing our first panel, if there are no additional opening statements. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, can I submit for the record some statistical data I have, please? Uh, without objection, uh, the gentleman's uh, submission is included in the record. I thank the gentleman. So ordered. So uh, we'll introduce our first panel. Uh, I'd like to introduce Robin Thomas, who is the Executive Director of Legal Community Against Violence. LCAV is a public interest law center dedicated to preventing gun violence by providing legal assistance to state and local governments. Be before joining LCAV last year, she was a practicing attorney in New York City. Uh, next, we'll hear from Paul Helmke who has served the last year as president of the Brady Campaign and Brady Center to Prevent Gun Violence, a nonpartisan grassroots organization working to prevent gun violence. Uh, Mr. Helmke has served as mayor of Fort Wayne, Indiana from 1988 through 2000, and during his tenure as mayor, he worked to strengthen the police department and implement community policing. Mr. Helmke served as president of the United States Conference of Mayors in 1997 and 98, and was a board member and chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Crime Prevention for the National League of Cities. Uh, the uh, final witness on the first panel will be uh, John Feinblatt. Mr. Feinblatt was appointed New York City's Criminal Justice Coordinator by Mayor Michael R. Bloomberg in January 2002. In this capacity, Mr. Feinblatt has served as the Chief Advisor on Mayor Bloomberg's Illegal Gun Strategy which includes innovative enforcement strategies, new local legislation, and the formation of a national coalition, Mayors Against Illegal Guns. Prior to his appointment, Mr. Feinblatt was the founding director of both the Center for Court Innovation, the country's leading think tank on problem-solving justice, and the Midtown Community Court. Welcome to all the witnesses. It is the policy of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify, I would ask the witnesses to please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. I ask that each of the witnesses now give a brief summary of uh, your testimony and keep uh, this summary to five minutes in length. Bear in mind that your complete written statement will be included in the hearing record. Ms. Thomas, you'll be our first witness. You may begin. Can you hear me? 
Thank you very much. Legal Community Against Violence sincerely appreciates this opportunity to speak to the committee about lethal loopholes, the deficiency in state and federal gun purchase laws. As you mentioned, LCAV is a public interest law center devoted to preventing gun violence. We were founded in 1993 after the assault weapon massacre at 101 California Street in San Francisco. I'm going to address three questions related to the deficiency in state and federal gun purchase laws. First, how do state and federal gun laws interact? As you mentioned, federal law establishes the baseline regarding the types of purchasers who are ineligible to acquire firearms, and those categories of prohibited purchasers include felons, illegal aliens, those subject to domestic violence protective orders, and the mentally ill. Some states then expand the federal law by applying broader standards to some or all of these categories. In addition, many states designate extra and additional classes of prohibited purchasers who are not found in the federal law. The second question I will address is what are the lethal loopholes in the federal system and how are states addressing them? First, there are numerous gaps in the federal law that prohibit certain individuals from purchasing firearms. Here I'm gonna to touch on two basic issues, those with mental illness and domestic violence offenders. With respect to mental illness, federal law prohibits firearm purchasers purchases by those who've been involuntarily committed or adjudicated as mental defective. This does not reach individuals with a wide range of potentially dangerous mental illnesses. For example, a person who is voluntarily committed to a mental institution can still lawfully purchase a firearm under federal law. Many states have broadened the category of mentally ill persons prohibited by including those who voluntarily or involuntarily are committed to a mental hospital. In the case of domestic violence offenders, federal law prohibits firearm purchasers by those who've been convicted of a misdemeanor crime of domestic violence and those subject to certain domestic violence protection orders. The federal prohibitions leave large gaps also allowing violent offenders to acquire firearms. For example, the protection order prohibition does not include those individuals who have not cohabitated with the person who they're subject of the restrictive order. So in other words, if you and I have not lived together and I'm subject to a restraining order, I may still purchase a firearm under federal law. More than half of the individuals who are subject to domestic violence protection orders fall into this category. So it's a large loophole in the domestic violence prohibition. And many states have acted to close that loophole. I also will address gaps in enforcement. As was mentioned, access to state records is a huge part of the issue with enforcement of the prohibited purchaser provisions. As the Virginia Tech incident illustrated, access to mental health and domestic violence records is seriously inadequate. And federal law does not and cannot require that states send relevant records to the FBI for inclusion in the NICS database. According to the FBI, only 22 states voluntarily contribute mental health records to NICS. We note the legitimate concern for privacy regarding mental health records. However, with laws that limit the use of such records, this concern can be adequately addressed. Lack of access to state records is also a significant obstacle with regard to perpetrators of domestic violence. A recent study showed that less than 50% of those believed to qualify, even under existing federal law, were not included in the system. One way states can improve access to prohibited purchaser records is by coming a point of contact or POC state. POC, POC states can then conduct background checks through the state system and have access to records which include NICS information as well as independent state information criminal history, and other databases. The FBI has been encouraging more states to serve as POCs, and at the present time, only 21 states serve as POCs either for handgun transfers or other gun transfers. In addition, several POC states already search mental health records automatically as part of the background check system. And on top of that, some states have decided to require reporting to mental health databases. This is an important point 
because it has two parts to it. The first is that there has to be reporting of mental health records. And then the second is that when a background check is done, that those mental health records are actually reviewed. It's the same situation for domestic violence offenders. It's a twofold problem that has to be addressed. Two other dangerous loopholes remain, which I will touch on briefly. One is the so-called default proceeds provision. And what this refers to is the instance when a background check is done and it is incomplete after three days. The gun automatically default proceeds to the requested purchaser. Approximately three or 4,000 guns a year proceed this way and then later have to be reacquired when it's found after the three-day period has passed that the person should not have passed the background check. Many states have closed this loophole in, in a variety of different ways, from including the length of time to not allowing a transfer if the background check is not completed. And the final loophole that I will mention is something that has already been mentioned, the private sale loophole. 40% of the guns transferred in this country take place through private sales, which are not subject to any background check at all. And so until unlicensed sellers are also regulated by the background check system, this will continue to remain an avenue for a huge quantity of the guns that are sold in the marketplace. I would just like to close by adding that H.R. 297 that the Congressman mentioned is a good step in the right direction, something that encourages states to report records to NICS and that begins to address the problem of the lack of information. It is a step in the right direction, but there's many other issues that need to be addressed, and we hope that this hearing will be a beginning of addressing some of these. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Thomas. Uh, Mr. Helmke. Thank you, uh, Chairman Kucinich, uh, Ranking Member Issa, uh, Congressman Davis, and fellow Hoosier, Congressman Burton, Mr. Bilbray, Congressman. I come to you um, as the recipient of two uh, NRA Marksmanship Awards from grade school, a lifelong Republican, born and raised in Indiana, where, as you indicated, I was the mayor of Fort Wayne for three terms. And I'm also here as the president of the Brady Campaign and Brady Center to Prevent Gun Violence, the nation's largest uh, organizations working for reasonable gun policies. I don't see a contradiction here. The proposals I recommend are common sense, simply common sense. They should appeal to most Americans across party and geographic lines. Sorry and can help make our communities safer. I've submitted my written testimony, so I'll just address a few points quickly here. We have an epidemic of gun violence in this country. Every year in America, almost 30,000 people are killed by gunfire, 10 times the death toll of 9-11. About 32 people are murdered every day with guns. That's a Virginia Tech massacre every day in this country. And for every death, there's another two or three people that are seriously wounded. In recent years, violent gun crime has spiked, increasing almost 50% from 2004 to 2005, the largest increase in 14 years. What are we going to do about it? What we're doing now to prevent gun violence clearly is not working. We need to plug the, legal, the lethal loopholes in our laws. There are many things we should do, but let me just touch on a few. Number one, we need to make sure that the Brady background check system is effectively applied. The Virginia Tech killer was prohibited from buying guns under federal law since a court had found him to be a danger to himself or others as a result of mental illness. Unfortunately, Virginia did not provide such orders to their state police, so the killer passed a background check and bought his guns. Effective Brady background checks with access to all relevant records would have stopped those sales. According to the FBI, in 28 states, no relevant mental health orders are made available for background checks so many people can buy guns even though they are prohibited by federal law. We need to close that legal, uh, lethal loophole. The Nix Improvement Act introduced by Ka uh, Carolyn McCarthy as H.R. 297 is a necessary step. This legislation would provide grants and other incentives to encourage states to forward all relevant records on people prohibited from possessing firearms to the federal national <laughs> instant criminal background check system. Had it been law, the Virginia Tech shooting may have been averted. Now, there's been a great deal of misinformation about the effect of gun laws on those being treated for mental illness, and I'd like to set the record straight. Under existing federal law, you will not be denied a gun simply because you have sought treatment for or been diagnosed with a mental illness. Existing federal law prohibits from buying guns only those mentally ill persons who have been adjudicated by a, quote, lawful authority, such as a court, to be a danger to themselves or others as a result of mental illness, or to, or to lack the mental capacity to manage their own affairs, as well as persons who have been involuntarily committed to a mental institution. 
Further, no one accesses your medical records in a background check. The only records entered into the federal or state databases are relevant court or other orders indicating that you fall into a prohibited category. And when anyone is denied a gun purchase because they fail a background check, the gun dealer simply gets back a, quote, denied message with no information as to why the person is denied. So federal gun laws create no disincentive for people to seek mental health treatment or obtain a diagnosis. But the Virginia Tech massacre provides another reminder that those who are dangerous because of mental illness should not be allowed to buy guns. Second point I want to address. We must be sure that no guns are sold without a background check. As uh, Congressman Davis pointed out, incredibly f current federal law allows people without a federal license to sell guns without a background check so long as the seller is not, quote, engaged in the business, close quote, of selling guns and the buyers from the same state. We need to close this loophole by passing the Gun Show Loophole Closing Act of 2007 introduced as H.R. 96 by Representative Castle from Delaware, co-sponsored by Representatives McCarthy and Shays. Number three, we must give law enforcement the tools and resources it needs to fight gun crimes, including illegal gun trafficking and corrupt gun dealers. Studies have shown, as you indicated, Mr. Chairman, that 1% of gun dealers sell almost 60% of crime guns. Yet we tie law enforcement's hands. We put blinders on them, and we give special protections to corrupt gun dealers who supply these criminals. Law enforcement must have all the information it needs. Congress must eliminate appropriation riders to ATS budget, the so-called so -called TR amendment that shields important gun data and makes it uniquely exempt from the Freedom of Information Act. We need to eliminate other restrictions that make it harder for law enforcement to crack down on corrupt dealers. Law-abiding gun dealers do not need special protections, and corrupt dealers don't deserve them. There's a number of other loopholes that we hope will be addressed in the future. The fact that there's no limit on the amount of guns that you can buy and the size of the arsenal you stock. The fact that terrorists can be on, this, on the terrorist watch list and they're not prohibited from purchasing guns currently. The fact that uh, weapons of war um, are, clear, are often uh, available for purchase. But all the proposals we've been talking about today are law and order proposals. They'll not prevent law-abiding citizens from having guns in their home if they choose. They'll not cost a single sportsman a day of hunting season. They are supported by law enforcement and by most Americans. Too many of our neighbors are suffering the same pain experienced by the Virginia Tech victims and their families every day. I ask Congress uh, what we should all be asking. What are you going to do about it? Thank you for having this hearing. Thank you for addressing the issue. You show that you're not silent on guns, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Feinblatt. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Issa, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I'm here to talk about crime control, not gun control. As Mayor Michael Bloomberg's criminal justice coordinator, I serve as the mayor's chief advisor on criminal justice policy. Controlling crime is my chief concern, and I can assure you that it's an absolute top priority for the mayor. I am proud today to represent a city that has made enormous strides combating crime. According to the FBI, New York City is the safest big city in America. In New York City, the crime rate has dropped 21 percent since Mayor Bloomberg took office. Already this year, homicides are down 23 percent compared to the same period last year, and shooting incidents are down 16 percent. Unfortunately, the national crime story isn't so bright. After years of decline, crime rates are now on the rise across the country. A recently released study by the Police Executive Research Forum shows that homicides are up 20 percent, while aggravated assault with a firearm has increased by 30 percent since 2004. This alarming trend is one of the reasons why mayors across the country are working together to combat the flow of illegal guns into their cities. One year ago, in April 2006, Republican Mayor Michael Bloomberg and Democratic Mayor Tom Menino of Boston invited 13 mayors to join in a conversation about the scourge of illegal guns. That initial group of 15 mayors has grown into the Mayors Against Illegal Guns Coalition, comprised of more than 225 mayors from more than 40 states representing over 50 million people. At the federal level, this coalition has one priority and one priority only, to repeal the TR Amendment restrictions on crime gun trace data. Let me be clear about what data we're talking about here because this data is about only one thing, and that's guns recovered in crimes. 
It is not about any sort of wholesale access to the sale records of lawful gun owners. Why do mayors oppose the TR amendments? It's simple. Their police chiefs are telling them that the TR amendment makes them do their jobs with a blindfold on. Despite the lessons we learn on the tragic days of days surrounding September 11th, the TR amendment prevents police from connecting the dots. There are four principal restrictions of the TR amendment. One, it restricts access to aggregate crime gun data, which means cities can't look at trends and patterns. Two, it blocks access to data from other cities and states, which means the police can't get a regional picture of where the illegal guns are flowing from. Three, it prevents cities from using gun trace data to hold accountable the few dealers who break the law. And four, it stops the ATF from producing national reports which prevent all of us from getting a full picture of how guns move into the illegal market. This makes no sense. Every year, Congress has made the T. Hart Amendment more and more restrictive. And this year, the Justice Department and the White House seem determined to make these restrictions even worse. As Mayor Bloomberg wrote to Attorney General Gonzalez on May 3rd of this year, Quote, your Justice Department has submitted an appropriations request to Congress that not only largely retains the T-Hart language, but makes it even worse, adding provisions that would require police officers to certify the reasons for their use of trace data, which could result in criminal prosecutions of police officers. The gun lobby has put forward two main talking points in an attempt to support its defense of the T-Hart Amendment. Neither stand up. First, they claim that the restrictions protect undercover law enforcement officers, but they have not documented a single case of an undercover officer being exposed by the release of trace data prior to the enactment of the TR Amendment. Second, they argue that it will subject gun dealers to undue harassment. But the truth is that 85% of dealers have no gun, crime gun traces in a given year, and as you've heard before, 1% of the dealers account for nearly 60% of the traces. Our coalition of 225 mayors knows the gun lobby's claims are false, and so do the 10 national law enforcement organizations, the more than 20 state and regional law enforcement organizations, and the more than 185 individual law enforcement executives who have written to Congress to oppose the T-Hart Amendment. Some ask, why are the mayors taking the fight against illegal guns into their own hands? It's because the federal government has so clearly dropped the ball. By their own admission, ATF is not up to the task. According to the Department of Justice Inspector General in fiscal year 2002, ATF revoked or refused to renew just 2.8% of the licenses of dealers who were found to have violations even though those dealers had an average of 70 violations each. And just three days ago, ATF's chief public affairs officer told Time Magazine that at the current rate of inspections, it would take 17 years to inspect all existing licensed firearm dealers. It is the federal government's failure to enforce the laws on the books that has forced New York City and others, and others to act. 90% of gun crimes recovered in New York City come from out of state. That's why New York City initiated lawsuits against 27 gun dealers from five states last year. In each of these 27 cases, we sent in undercovers and caught the dealers in the act of completing illegal straw purchases. I am pleased to report that 12 of the 27 dealers have now settled out of court and agreed to unprecedented oversight of their firearms sales. Having spoken to countless mayors, countless prosecutors, and countless police, there is only one way to interpret what Congress did when it enacted the TR Amendment. It chose to protect the privacy of criminals over the lives of police officers. If this Congress is serious about getting tough on crime, then it will repeal the TR restrictions and help state and local enforcement combat illegal guns. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Feinblatt. As a, uh, I just want to indicate how we're going to proceed. Uh, uh, there is a vote on, and the ranking member, Mr. Issa, has requested uh, uh, time at this moment, and I, so I'll yield to him. And then after that, we're going to take a break for the votes. Uh, there could be about 45 to 50 minutes. I would ask the uh, panel to remain for questions. 
So at, at this time, uh, the chair will uh, yield to Mr. Issa. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I apologize for not having been here at the beginning to make my opening statement. I, we were unavoidably delayed in a piece of uh, conference business, as we call it, a vote within the committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding this hearing today. Uh, I have forwarded a letter that objects to some aspects of this committee hearing not being as full and complete as I'd like it to be. However, it is very clear that at a minimum we will receive uh, a good cross-section of some of those legitimate loopholes that exist, particularly the, uh, the mental illness failed to implement that has clearly, clearly played a part in the tragic deaths of 32 at Virginia Tech. Moreover, it is very clear that Congress does have a continued role in working with the states to see that the full intent of Congress, not just under the Brady Bill, but under all our, le our prior legislation, is implemented. I happen to come from California, a state that is known for tough gun laws. But even there, I uh, want to commend, and this doesn't often happen uh, these days, uh, Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez for the fact that he repeatedly insisted that in California that federal gun laws be enforced even in a state with some of the toughest gun laws. That federal U.S. attorney uh, arm is extremely important. And if anything, uh, although the President made it a top priority, it needs to be an even higher priority. We cannot stand behind the Second Amendment, which I do very strongly, if, in fact, we will not ensure that those who legitimately should be denied the right to keep and bear arms are, in fact, denied that. I look forward to this hearing. I have uh, a strong view that we should have at least one follow-up hearing in which some of the people who strongly support the Second Amendment and strongly support that we do not need additional laws are given an opportunity to make their case of how we can, in fact, with the existing laws, enforce sufficiently to make those who should not have guns not have guns. I believe that the firearm laws need to be looked at carefully, but most importantly, I look forward to our witnesses giving us the insight into the lack of enforcement that has led to many tragedies around the United States. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll put the rest of it in for the record with unanimous consent. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, Unanimous consent uh, without objection. The Domestic Policy Subcommittee will resume. Our uh, hearing today is on lethal loopholes, deficiencies in state and federal gun purchase laws. Uh, we're now at the point where we're going to uh, ask the first panel to answer questions. And I would like to begin by um, asking both Ms. Thomas and Mr. Helmke. Without closing the gun show loophole, is there anything else that can be done that helps prevent prohibited persons from getting guns, or does reform just divert individuals to unregulated private gun uh, sales, uh, individuals who are now in NICS? I think as has already been discussed by members of the panel, there are so many areas in which you can begin. I think it can begin with closing some of the way in which these categories are defined, whether it's mental health prohibition or domestic violence offender prohibition. So at the state level, that can be done, and certainly as well at the federal level. Um, and both of those things wouldn't entail closing the private sale loophole, but would entail shoring up prohibitions that already exist. Um, secondarily to actually impacting those provisions, there are other categories of purchasers who are not prohibited. For example, domestic violent juvenile offenders are not prohibited under federal law from acquiring firearms. That is something that might need to be looked at as to whether there is a way to implement that into the system. Certainly many states already have created 
prohibitions around particular categories that aren't covered by the federal law. And then lastly, going back to the state record keeping and the way in which that is transferred to the federal level. Right now, you do have states that report very well up to the NICS system and the FBI, and that is very helpful, especially as the chairman mentioned, with regard to our porous borders. If in California, we have very good record keeping for mental illness and I'm in the system, but I move to another state, say Nevada, and California doesn't report to the FBI or NICS, therefore in Nevada they won't have access to that information. So I think there's ways in which the data can be transferred that would be extremely helpful to shoring up some of these problems. Mr. Helmke. I hear the, que the, the question usually comes to me in terms of, well, the bad guys don't follow the rules, so why should we make rules? Um, and uh, I, I think if we analyze this, though, the guns come from someplace. And we don't want to make it easy for dangerous people to get guns. That's why we have the 1968 Gun Control Act. That's why we have the Brady Bill, to, to do a check to make sure that prohibited purchasers, we don't rely on the prohibited purchaser filling out the form. We check to see what the records are. So again, the first thing we need to do is to make sure that we're strengthening the Brady Bill that we get good information into the system from the states as to felons and other prohibited purchasers. And that's, that's the first crucial part. Then we need to make sure, I think, that the Brady background checks are actually applied to all sales, the, the so-called gun show loophole, the private seller uh, exception that we talked about. But then we have to focus on the thing that, uh, that Mr. Feinblatt talked about, and that is that guns do get in, uh, criminals do pick up guns um, illegally. But where do those guns come from? And uh, when you talk to police chiefs around the country, when you talk to mayors around the country, most guns that are used in crimes, it's been a fairly short period of time that it's come from a legitimate gun dealer to the street. I mean, it's not old guns we're seeing used on crimes. Most guns that are used in crimes are two to three years old. They've come fairly quickly from the legitimate market to the, to the, the criminal market. How does that happen? That's one of the reasons that we focus on TR. We need to find out where the guns are coming from. So, and, so and once you find where they're coming from, then you can develop strategies to make it harder. Strengthening ATF, dealing with the uh, bulk sales of guns. And this goes to the issue of the completeness of the data in the NICS. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I mean the following, including all of the federal prohibited persons categories. What is the percentage of data that's been entered into the NICS uh, database in a form that can be used by the Brady background check, right. for example? The states have done a, a very good job uh, in terms of felony records. Um, where the states haven't done a very good job are with regard to the other categories. And this deals with those who are dangerous to themselves or others because of mental illness. Uh, um, it's a category that people put in the, in the NICS index is what they call it. But uh, for example, in terms of people that are considered dangerous to themselves or others because of mental illness, uh, the, the mental illness category of prohibited purchaser, there's only about 235,000 names entered into that record. Um, I've seen some estimates that there have been at least 2.6 million people institutionalized involuntarily in this country. Um, that means well, there, I, there's a disconnect between the, the mental health records that are getting in there and the number of people that would actually be a prohibited so, purchaser. So, for example, if you had a complete NICS database that would include, let's say, 1,000 pieces of information or 1,000 pieces of data, and, and NICS had only access to about 500, uh, what you know, what would you say, the, you know, could you give a quantification? Uh, you just said well, two, 235,000 of 1.2 million. Now, it, it's, and these are estimates because we don't have complete records. Well, how complete, but, but can, based you give, on, can you give me a, a, a rough estimate? Right, yeah, in, in terms of the mental illness records, in terms of uh, a disqualifying mental illness uh, findings that someone's dangerous to themselves or others, a prohibited purchaser, it's probably just 10%. Of, really? of the records are there. Virginia actually is one of the better states in terms of reporting records. They've reported about 80,000 instances. Uh, but that, that's a mental health records. What about, health what records. about criminal conviction data? Is it just as problematic in terms of? Uh, yeah, well, it, particularly when you look at misdemeanors um, dealing with the domestic violence area that, that uh, Ms. Thomas talked about. Um, again, the states do a pretty good job because they've computerized most of their felony records. When you get into misdemeanors, when you get into uh, restraining orders, when you get into the mental illness disqualifying records, those, it's basically hit or miss whether the state's given you anything at all. I'm going to uh, come back to that line of questioning, uh, but uh, it's now time for 
Uh, Mr. Burton, if he so chooses to uh, ask questions. Mr. Burton. You know, I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I'm concerned about, uh, you're advocating, I guess, that the federal government demand of the states that they provide adequate records. I mean, that's essentially what you want to do, right? Well, in, in 1968, the federal government said that certain people were prohibited purchasers and declared as a policy that those people were dangerous people and should not be getting guns. And yeah, so I, we're trying to figure out how do we turn that statement of what, who was a prohibited purchaser into an effective enforcement tool. Uh -huh. are, are you advocating that there be a, a federal records kept, that the states are required to send these records to Washington, D.C., and that we make sure we keep track of them through the federal government? Cur currently, states have a choice. They, they, can be, they can be what's called a point of contact state, and I think there's... 22 or so of those, about 20. Well, uh, about 20 of those now, where they handle the records on their own. There's other states who decide they don't want to handle that and they send it to the federal government. So right now the well, states have a choice. Yeah, I, I understand, but uh, if you if, if a states don't comply with the things the way you think they should, then you feel the federal government should force them to do that. Well, actually, H.R., uh, Carolyn McCarthy's bill, the, the Nixon Improvement Act, wouldn't be forcing them to. What it does... Well, then what the, does it do? How, how, do you, how do you enforce it if it doesn't force the states to comply? If, if, you, if you don't mind, I don't think it's about forcing. In fact, I think there are issues as to whether it could actually be enforced on the states. I don't believe that that is an approach that would... Um, be appropriate under the way that our system operates under the 10th Amendment. I do think that as he's talking about, um, there's ways to encourage and give incentives and so, to... So, okay, so... Right. And, and, and that's the point about, I wanted to... You're talking about encouraging the states. Well, I think the states right now, for the most part, really want to keep the guns out of people's hands that shouldn't have them. And I don't know how this legislation is going to improve that. It, well, I mean, the, you're just suggesting we want you to do better? No, it's it's... The, the, There's financial incentives included in the legislation that I believe would be... Okay, that's, I wanted to get to that. Okay. Financial incentives. So we're going to have the federal government, in effect, mandating through financial uh, uh, incentives to, to the states to do, do certain things? Paul, you can correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is one of the things that the McCarthy bill does is to provide the financing that some of the states might need in order to help them, to enable them to computerize records and to bring some of these records well, okay. up to speed. I, I, I so, think your goals are laudable, but let me, let me just tell you, in, in Indiana, there have been incentives uh, to create more policemen, and the federal government has put money into the program to create more policemen to cut the crime rate. And then the federal government, after they hire the policemen a few years later, don't com doesn't uh, don't com continue to, to comply and, and, and fund those mandates. And so you've got a situation there where you get into this thing and then you've got the federal government who's supposed to pay for these things as an incentive and then they, they, they drop the ball. And I'm going to tell you, that happens an awful lot. As you, you as being mayor, you know about unfunded it, mandates. It, well, let, let me go, I, I don't have a lot of time, so I want to go into some other questions. Uh, you said that there should be background checks, Mr. Feinblatt, uh, on people that are selling guns person to person, right? No, I did not. Well, what, how did you explain did that to me again? background checks, Congressman. You said, well, people selling a gun to another person, how do you? I didn't discuss that. The only thing that I've commented on today is the Tihard Amendment, which restricts law well, enforcement. I must, I must have misunderstood. I, I talked about background because checks. Because I, so. I thought you said. I think it was Mr. Helmke. Yeah. I thought you, well, somebody, I thought it was you, said that there should be background checks on a person to person basis, is that right? It, it, it's I indicated that the Brady background check system isn't going to fully work if 40% of the sales of guns aren't covered by the Brady background uh, well, check the, the, system. The, the, you, and that if, if the requirement was that private sales, uh, that the, the, if private sales were covered, that if you got the unlicensed seller exception out of the way where people can go to a gun show, go to the, the, the desk that's set okay, up that I says, I'm an unlicensed uh, a dealer and therefore I can sell you the guns without the background check, that would help our system work. The, the, well, the, the shooter at Virginia the Tech. The enforcement of that, I think, would be virtually impossible because you've got so many people that have guns and so many people that sell them to other people or give them to other people. Now, there is a liability statute, as I understand it, that says if you give a gun or sell a gun to somebody else and they commit a crime, you have a, you have a, a, a responsibility and you can be sued. So I think we, always, we already have a deterrent. I want to ask one more question. 
I have a friend, and I won't go into the details. He and his wife are getting divorced. She was running around with another guy, and he was crushed. They've got, he's, he's got a couple of kids, and it's, it's really a problem. So as a result, he wanted to make sure that he did the right thing, so he went for counseling, went to a mental health center for counseling. The counseling worked. He went to his church. That worked. And he's now in good shape, and he's, he's, he's not any threat to his wife or anybody else because he's learned how to cope with it. But the mental health record of this man would be a deterrent for him getting a gun, would it not? No, no. The, Why not? The, no, because there will be a record of it, won't No, it? as I indicated, it, it only deals that the federal law and the implementation of who's defined as a prohibited purchaser only deals with someone who's been involuntarily committed or someone who has been adjudicated by a court as a danger to themselves or others because of mental illness. Going for marital counseling, um, uh, getting the, that sort of voluntary treatment, uh, uh, therapy, uh, medication, whatever, as long as you're not in front of a judge or someone is, who's got that official capacity, then it doesn't show up in the records. Well, Brian and I were talking a minute ago, and he may want to pursue this question further, but uh, are the mental health agencies in favor of what you're trying to do? It's, uh, they're represented here, I, I believe, with another panel, but we've been talking to them. We don't want a stigma on mental health. We want people to go in for mental health counseling. That's not my question, we, Mr. We, Mayor. My question is, the mental health organizations, are they in favor of what you're I, I can't speak for them, but I, I believe that I believe based on our discussions that, that we can reach agreement here. They agree that individuals that are a danger to themselves or others because of mental illness should not be purchasing guns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank the gentleman, the gentleman from California. Thank you very much. Um, Mayor, seeing that we're uh, stringing you out right now, let's, let's not interrupt the pace. Um, <laughs> I'm used to it. <laughs> Appreciate it. I was mayor for six years. Uh, when I started off, I'd, uh, 27 years old, uh, it was uh, rather an interesting situation to lead a city at that age that you'd grown into. And they, half of the staff and police chief used to change my diapers before I was in there. So it was, <laughs> um, but I would, I would say, in fact, I remember that was the year you were in Cleveland. We, they <laughs> actually say, did I think a story right. on, there was three yeah. of us that was the, the new, the new Politicos. We all, um, we all have seriously, the, in common here. The, yeah, the uh, <laughs> ancient history. The um, let's talk to the gun show issue. Mayor, when's the last time you went to a gun show? Um, four years ago, I guess. Okay. Now, you said 40 percent of the the uh, sales of guns are not regulated at this time. It's, it's estimated. Since we don't keep records on that, it's just an estimate. But it's estimated that 40 percent. Is that 40 percent of what you're estimating is 40 percent are being sold through gun shows? Not, it's not all. Not just gun shows. It's private sales. So it could be gun shows. It could be classified ads. It could what be neighborhood. What percentage do you think is being sold through gun shows unregulated? I don't have any hard data on what that. What percentage I, I, of the gun show sales do you think is unregulated? The 40 percent figure is that I'm under oath here, so that I'm, I'm just guessing at this stage. I've seen the 40 percent figure. I've, I've seen others who say that a gun shows maybe it's 25 percent of the total sales or something like that. Uh, then, I, then, boy, it dark, definitely is not the gun shows that I've seen around. Okay. The fact is I would challenge anybody. And I'm not, you know, I have had the, the NRA attack me on positions. Mm -hmm. I've had Brady support me on issues. But I think that we need to keep grounded is the overwhelming majority of people who are engaged in gun shows are professionals that are licensed. Very few, very few. And I guess in my mind, I remember the son, the 12 year old son, and the man selling the black powder rifle and with spare barrels. And I remember, because mm -hmm. I don't shoot modern mm -hmm. firearms. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm exempt from all these rules. Yeah. I can go buy my musket and my yeah. cap and ball and get anything I want over the counter. But to s imply that the, that gun shows pose a major threat when, you know, or a big exposure here, a big source of unsupervised purchases, I think doesn't reflect the fact that the overwhelming majority of people who are at gun shows are licensed dealers who are functioning under mm -hmm. that vehicle. Now, we can go then, so if, I, if we can just say, you guys want to take a shot at that, I have some real problems with, yeah. with you 
eliminating the deal that most of the people that are dealing, most firearms sold under the gun show um, process, is under some kind of regulatory deal. And you could take, counter my, my argument if you want. Well, well first of all, California uh, does require background checks at gun shows. So if you're going to gun shows in California, yes, they do background checks because that's a state law and that's been effective in reducing the amount of guns that get into the illegal market uh, in California. But my issue was not the background check. It was the person, the regulations that were imposed on the people that are actually selling the firearms. The right. And in, in California, if you're an unlicensed dealer, uh, the way it works in California is if, some, if you want to purchase from the collector, they then take the form to the licensed dealer who's in the booth next door and for a $5 fee or whatever, they run the, the instant check and come back with a you're approved type thing. So in effect, the gun show, the so-called gun show loophole has been closed in California the and they do do the, the back. The point I was checks. making though, and, and Ms. Thomas, if you want to go over, mm -hmm. you still are down to this issue that the overwhelming majority of people engaged in the sale of firearms at gun shows are licensed dealers. Yeah, most are. And, and, and actually, and, and, and part of the point, though, even in the statistic, most of the licensed dealers do a good job. It's only 1% okay. of the dealers my, that contribute 60% of the guns. My point was that the fact is that the, the, the perception that this is an unregulated, no oversight, that it's a great majority no. of mom and yeah. pops giving the sales. And let me just say, you've been a mayor. I would really ask you to question the ability of government learning just not to overreach, the ability of taking a theory and making a practical uh -huh. application the ability for even a local government, let alone a federal government, to regulate one-on-one -on -one sales between individuals. And I give you an example. We don't do a very good job at regulating those who are selling, buying and selling cars under the law as a dealer, a car dealer. If we can't regulate the buying and selling of cars under that, what makes you think we can do but, it? With but firearms? we still have laws dealing with the sale of cars, and you still have the licenses, and you still have the process that it goes through the, the state uh, bureau, motor vehicles, whatever, uh, to get the license transferred and collect the sales Mr. tax. Chairman, and all the things my the point state being is, even with the laws on the books, we admit that those of us in right. local government know the, the, the that crucial. This, yeah, the this crucial is a huge problem to try to enforce the sale of automobiles. Something you're registering, yeah. something you're putting on the street, something that's pretty yeah. big that you don't. Yeah. You're not going to put in a box and take home. If you're talking about now something that can go into a box and be taken home, just I just want to raise the issue no. of what a huge, huge leap in practical application we have to make here. And that, that yeah. was just yeah. my point. From and being and, a and I think the whole point with this discussion on guns is what we're doing now is not working. We need to find things that just don't sound good in law but are actually going to be effective. And that's what I'm, I'm trying to say. And I'm saying, we make it too easy for and, dangerous people to and get And I'm the just weapons. saying the big thing is what's effective is more important than what sounds good. Right. I, I agree totally. And I yield back. If I can just add one tiny thing, it's that for as you mentioned, you are talking about, if you are talking about federally licensed firearms dealers who are the ones at the gun shows and if they are running background checks, and if you are a law-abiding gun owner, you know that the federal instant background check system is incredibly quick and efficient. It is not very burdensome. It's something that for people who know the rules and understand how the system works, it is not a big deal to have this instant check run before they get their guns. And what it does is it takes the difference between someone who should have a gun and is law-abiding versus someone who, who shouldn't have a gun. And we just, we make sure that that person who's at the gun show just gets that instant check run and we make sure they, they fill the categories. Ma'am, you missed my point. My point was the perception that this was a, this problem was a large portion of gun shows when in fact it is a very small part of the problem within the gun shows because the overwhelming majority are already plugged into the registration system. I, I, I did just get a, a just clarification here. According to an, an ATF report from 1999, they estimate that 25 to 50 percent of gun show sellers are private parties. So, I, would, I would totally disagree with that. Okay, I'm, I'm just saying that's what the 1999 and ATF report I'd also report point said. out that it's estimated that 1 percent of the criminal guns are acquired at gun shows. Okay. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, we're going to go to another round of questions here. Uh, uh, Congressman Burton, I, I'm going to, uh, can, you, can you wait five minutes? Sure. Okay, we're, we're just going to go to one more round of questions. And I would like to uh, ask uh, Mr. Helmke, uh, you know, if you have a, uh, a fairly informed quantitative assessment you can give us at this moment, fine. If you don't, I'd like you to provide the information to the committee 
with respect to the completeness of these records on data related to prohibited persons or with respect to criminal conviction data? Do you, can you tell us what percent? And if you don't know, can you provide it? It's my understanding, and I'll, I'll double check this and, and provide it. It's my understanding that in terms of felony conviction records, that it's, it's pretty close to complete. Um, and and mental health, you said 10 percent? And with, with, with all other uh, disqualifiers, mental health, uh, dishonorable discharges, uh, restraining orders, uh, outstanding warrants, that it's just hit or miss and uh, 10 percent to 20 percent uh, at the best. Okay. Uh, I want to go to Mr. Feinblatt. Uh, could you tell me why did New York City feel that it was necessary to bring its uh, lawsuit against the gun dealers? I, I think it was 27 gun dealers. And uh, couldn't it just call up and request that the ATF do something about the flow of illegal guns into your city? Well, I think the problem is that uh, the ATF is uh, not uh, keeping up their end of the bargain. As you know, I think that the Department of Justice, in fact, did a report that was issued, I think, in 2002, which said that the ATF inspected about 4.5% of the firearm licensees nationwide. So that's about 45, 4,600 of the 104,000 FFLs. And um, they found in those inspections that, in fact, 42% of the inspected licensees had violations. And not, we're not just talking about one violation. What they found was, on average, the licensees had 70 violations each. Uh, nonetheless, in the face of data like that, the ATF revoked uh, or refused to renew only 2.8 percent of the licenses of dealers with well, violations. Well, wait a minute, though. I, you know, why, why didn't the uh, ATF do what you did just, you know, before bringing this suit, and that is conduct aggressive investigations to make sure that federally licensed gun dealers are not breaking the law and allowing straw purchases. Uh, we're talking, why does the ATF not do it? Because the ATF is not committed to this as part of their mission, and there are several reasons why. Let me give you some disturbing evidence, which is even more disturbing than the numbers. Uh, when in this same report, um, um, investigators interviewed ATF inspectors. What they found was that 78 percent of the inspectors that were interviewed said that when doing an inspection, they did not look for signs of straw purchases whatsoever. Another 67 percent of the inspectors said that they rarely referred information gathered during an inspection for a criminal investigation by the ATF because they actually didn't believe that the ATF would follow up. And so what we've got now is a culture within the the ATF that isn't taking uh, their mission seriously. Now, let me tell you, it's not just the ATF. Congress hasn't made it any easier. Uh, as you know, Congress has, in some ways, tied the hands of, of the ATF. It has restricted uh, inspections of dealers to once per year. It has required licensed dealers. It has uh, prevented ATF from requiring licensed dealers to physically check their inventory against their records. It has prevented uh, ATF um, from revoking a license until all legal uh, means are exhausted, which can take years even if they find uh, that a dealer has been convicted of a felony. So I think that what we have is a culture of lax enforcement within the ATF, and I think uh, Congress has abetted that and aided that. And, and, when, and, and you're saying that with respect to the T. Hart Amendment, for example? Is that I'm saying about? that in effect to the restrictions that we placed on ATF and the fact that the restrictions that we placed on local law enforcement getting information about uh, crime uh, gun trace data is just one more example of trying to shield the gun industry. Well, with, I mean, the, with the TR Amendment in effect, could you now obtain the type of trace data that you've used from the ATF and use it in a civil suit? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, not. Don't even think about a civil suit. You know, t at least 20 states in the country have state licensing regulations. Uh, uh, trace data is not admissible in those uh, in those uh, state uh, regulatory hearings. And so what you've got is the federal government basically stopping the dam well, let's of go, information. Well, let's go then to the consent decree that New York worked out uh, about the monitoring that went on that, you know, that the dealers settled with New York about, you know, you had a consent decree. Gun well, dealers we, said, look, uh, we're going to settle up with you, New York. Uh, 
What happened with that? What we did was we sued 27 dealers from five states. Already 12 of them, nearly half, have settled uh, with the city of New York. Uh, we haven't looked to put anybody behind bars. That uh, isn't our goal. We haven't looked to put anybody out of business. That certainly isn't at our goal. What the, cons what the settlements require is that a special master be appointed to oversee the business uh, with the cooperation of the FFL for a period of three years. If there are continued violations of uh, federal, state, or local laws, the special master has the right to impose a penalty. Um, and if there are violations, the three-year clock resets. So just one final question before we go back to Mr. Burton, and that is, from a policy standpoint, would you tell this committee what benefits New York City was able to achieve uh, in entering into this cons uh, consent decree? Look, the basics of law enforcement are trying to find, define who the bad guys are. Most dealers are good, honest business people. ATF tells us that only about 1% of the dealers are responsible for 50% of the crime guns. But what trace data does is it actually pinpoints who are the people who are breaking the law. And what New York has tried to do is use that trace data to actually pinpoint in a very precise way who's breaking the law and then come to some agreement with them. Let me that's, ask you. that's what our goal is. Our goal isn't to interfere with, with uh, legal dealers. Our goal isn't to, uh, to um, question the right of people to have guns. Our goal is plain and simple. It's to enforce the law. So the federal government uh, kind of applauded that and uh, responded to this investigation lawsuit and consent decree in a favorable way? I mean, how did, did ATF say, Hey, New York, you, you, we have something to learn from Absolutely you? not. What the federal government do, did was threaten New York City, just like the what federal government. What do you mean, threaten? Basically wrote a letter to the city of New York and saying that in under, under certain circumstances, if you continue enforcing the law, mind you, uh, you could be subject to, to criminal penalties. But what's, what's so telling here is that we've got a pattern. The White House, the FOP, and the Department of Justice it has now recently taken the T-Hart amendments one step further. And what they are now suggesting is that every single police officer, every rank and file police officer who wants to trace a gun, the basic thing that you want to do if you're trying to catch criminals and put them away or try to catch ca traffickers is to get data. What they've said is that every police officer needs to certify the purposes for seeking the trace data and if those purposes are broader than the investigation of one gun at a time that somebody is um, liable to go to prison for five years. The real question is, who does that help and who does that hurt? That only helps one people, criminals. Okay, who does it hurt? It hurts law enforcement. There's a basic choice here. Who do you want to protect? Do you want to protect cops or you want to protect criminals? The city of New York wants to protect cops. It seems that the White House, the Justice Department, and the ATF, by making the rank and file police officer certify the purposes for the request of data and threatening them with, with jail, wants to really hurt cops and help, help criminals. And what's so striking about this amendment is just one year ago, the Department of Justice itself, when considering the idea of having police officers face criminal penalties for doing their job wrote to Congress that this would have a chilling effect, it would be dilatory as to law enforcement, it would, it would uh, chill police officers from doing their job by requesting key data and by sharing key data. I, I, I thank the gentleman, and if you, you know, whatever you have in the record that you'd like to submit for the record on that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, this uh, has gone on about uh, more than nine minutes, so I just want to say to Mr. Burton and Mr. Bilbray, if uh, each of you would like to consume nine minutes, you're entitled to that each. Thank you. First of all, let me just say that people who don't agree with you do support law enforcement and the policemen. The implication of some of your remarks were that the people who don't agree with you uh, aren't uh, caring enough about the police, and I don't think that's true. And a lot of police officers around this country don't agree with the position you've taken. I don't know the percentage, but uh, there's, there, I'm sure there's a lot of them. <clears throat> How many guns are there in America? Do you know? Uh, I don't know. Mr. Helm, he probably has that figure on the top of his time. There's estimates of around 200 million. 200 million. More than that. 
You're going to keep track of 200 million guns? I mean, what you're talking about, Mr. Helmke, Mayor Helmke, is that if there's a sale from one individual to another individual, there ought to be a background check. 200 million guns. You, you, you've got to be joking. No, that's a, that's a, we're awash with guns in this country, and that's, so that's part right, of the problem. And, 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 and to start creating a, a bureaucracy and making law-abiding citizens criminals if they sell a gun to some other law-abiding citizen, it, it doesn't make any How sense. How do they know they're a law-abiding citizen if they don't do a background check before they sell it? That's the, that's the problem. <laughs> and most of the people aren't selling their guns. A lot are collections, a lot are handed down from their family, a lot they... They use uh, um, many people that own have a lot of guns. It's uh, while there's that many guns out there, there's also estimates that only 25% of the households have a gun too. I think is, is the figure. So it's those guns well, are where, basically well, I, okay. You said 25% yeah. of the households. Where'd you get that figure? I, I think that's. Um, I think it's still some of that's through the Department of Justice. Yeah. They come out with reports, and and it's, I think it might be cited in our testimony if you take. But a it's look an there. estimate. Yeah, it's an estimate because there is no system of registration yeah. of, of guns in this country right now. So all of this data um, is generally collected through estimates and the numbers that we do let, have. Let me ask you a question. You just said there, there's no registration in this country right now. Are you for advocate? Are you advocating registration of guns? Um, you know, I certainly think that there are ways to go about it that are feasible, and I do think that some kind of registration system like we have for cars in this country um, would certainly be helpful in knowing how many we have, knowing where they are, um, and being able to understand a little better well, what the issue let, let is. Let me just tell you, there's an awful lot of people. There's 200 million guns out there. There's an awful lot of people that are concerned about the Second Amendment and their constitutional rights, and they're afraid if you register all guns, at some point in the future, there may be a tyrannical government that uses the registration of those guns to disarm everybody in this country in violation of the Second Amendment. And that's, well, I see you shaking your head back there. It's a fact. People I mean, are concerned about that. I, I, I absolutely hear what you're saying, and, and certainly a discussion of the Second Amendment is a very um, interesting legal argument. And I would, I would hold that the Supreme Court of this country and the 200 cases that have come since Miller in 1939 have held that the Second Amendment is not a bar to sensible, sane, common sense gun regulation, that those laws, things like background checks, have been uphel upheld hundreds of times by the courts of this country. So the Second Amendment, with all due respect, is not a prohibition on common sense gun regulations that well, will save common lives. Common sense gun regulations, I agree with you, but you're talking about registration, and that's, that's a different subject, but I, I'm certainly not for that. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I uh, uh, don't think I need to ask any more questions. I think I've... Congressman, may I, may I just uh, uh, respond to the comment you made? Um, you know, this isn't an issue of whether you disagree with one position or don't agree with another, whether you're for cops or against cops. This is really an issue of whether you're going to threaten cops with imprisonment for doing their job. And that's actually what the Justice Department, the White House, and the ATF are now calling for by requiring police officers to certify. And everybody, everybody in the law enforcement world just about sees this issue for what it is. And that's why 10 national law enforcement organizations oppose the T-Hart Amendment. It's why over 20 um, state and regional law enforcement organizations oppose the T-Hart Amendment. It's why um, over 175 police chiefs from around the country oppose the T-Hart Amendment. And it's why 225 mayors, Republicans, Democrats, and independents oppose the T-Hart Amendment. Okay, they me, want cops many, to do many, their job. How many police chiefs are there in America? Uh, there, are, there are obviously many in, oh, how in many? the city. I don't have the you number. You said 175 police chiefs. I'd just like to know what percentage of the uh, I don't have the percent, but I'm delighted to, um, to give that to you. I was just given, uh, given uh, a note from my staff here. It says both the BATFE and the Fraternal Order of Police oppose release of trace data. It's true. The uh, FOP... Well, you didn't say that, though. The you, just, FOP, you, just cited, you just cited a bunch of people that oppose you and a bunch of groups that oppose you, but don't you think it's important also to say how many uh, support the other side? There is one police organization in this country that supports uh, the T. Hart Amendments, a single police organization. Stack that against 10 national police organizations, 22 state and regional organizations, 175. It is a lone voice, and... What is that lone voice? The Fraternal Order of Police? It is the Fraternal Order of Police, The Fraternal but Order of Police... 
that the majority of the policemen in this country are members of the Fraternal Order of Police. Yes, so except what you're saying well, one or, one organization, but that's the majority of the policemen in this country. Well, and the, and the BATF also opposes it. Uh, the Fraternal Order of Police doesn't speak with one voice, and I would refer you to this letter from the Illinois, for instance, Fraternal Order of Police, which is, constitutes 10 percent of the entire membership of the Fraternal Order of Police. What about the other Without 90? objection, we'll on record, that in the record. Absolutely. That's fine. What about the other 90 percent? On record, absolutely well, What about the other 90 percent? They're not alone, and I think that you well, will see many. What about the other 90 percent? You just said 10 percent. What about the other 90 percent? Uh, uh, with all due respect, one organization, the Fraternal Order of Police, which has basically taken the position that the reason why that the Tihard Amendment is a good thing is this. They have said that it does two things. It protects um, dealers from harassment. Well, 85% of dealers in this country have absolutely no traces. 1% of the dealers are responsible for 60% of the crime guns, and therefore those, well, deal those dealers are not at risk. And in addition, yeah. well, the you, other, you, 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 the you other reason... Filibuster. Let me just say this. I'm not filibustering. Yes, I'm trying are. to answer let your question. Say, let me just say this. When you start quoting statistics, you know, you need to go the whole route. You don't say that uh, uh, the Fraternal Order of Police is, are not for, all of them are for this, and say, well, the Illinois, which consists of 10 percent of the or members of the Fraternal Order of Police, support your position. You, you, you need to talk about the other 90 percent as well. That's Just don't give half the story, give the whole story. It's one, it's one organization that's the rank and file. Every police, every police organization that represents chiefs who look at crime on a macro level, not on a one at a time level, opposes it. And so what's the other reason that the FOP says that, um, that uh, the, we shouldn't release trace data? They say, well, the, it could expose um, undercover operations. However, when the ATF and the FOP have been asked under oath whether they can give one single example in federal court of an instance where an undercover operation was compromised, they were unable to do it. When Todd Tehart has been asked whether he can give one single example of an undercover operation that has been compromised, he's been unable to do it. In fact, well, let, let me. What the real reason that we have the Tehard amendments, I think we can find by looking at the Washington Post from July 21, 2003, okay. when Todd Tehart was asked why he put in the Tehard amendments. I'm not asking you about Todd Tehart. I'm, I'm not asking that question about uh, Todd. Sir, just, sir just, the FOP supports Todd Tehart. We're talking about the FOP. No, 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 no. no just the me. reason that the, they are supporting the Tehard amendments is because, I quote, I wanted to make sure I was fulfilling the needs of my friends who are firearms dealers. The N and the NRA official said uh, they were helpful in making sure I had my bases covered. What okay. we have here is another example okay, just, of they, Congress uh, bending right. over backwards I mean, to, go on to on protect on. the you gun industry. Point. Let me just say this to you, or ask you this question. How many people are in the FOP around the country? Um, if uh, 35,000, about uh, several hundred thousand, about 300,000, I think. Okay, and how many oppose the T. Hart Amendment and take your position? Uh, there are many states, there are states that are fractured. I don't have that answer, but well, you I can't. Should. Why should I? I can tell you this. Because you're making One, categorical statements that can't be verified. I'm not making a categorical statement. One police organization opposes it, and 10 nationals, one police organization supports it, 10 nationals oppose it, 22 state and regionals oppose it, 175 police chiefs. Uh, I, I, that's how I do addition that way. The FOP represents more than all of those you named. Combined. That's it. I have no more questions. I, I want to uh, thank the gentleman from Indiana. I, I want to uh, ask the witness uh, if um, you could provide this committee with the um, uh, qualification and a quantification of the various groups that have taken positions on this that you offer to this committee as uh, proof of the position that you hold. If you could do Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Appreciate it very much. And also, without objection, the Washington Post article that you uh, mentioned, if it could be included in the record, uh, and, the, and the letter from the uh, Ellen. Is it? 
we'll from the Illinois us. FOP, if it could be included in the record without objection. Uh, Mr. Bilbray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Bilbray, you have uh, nine minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope to not use it all up. Uh, but I, I, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank Ms. Thompson for, I look, you know, I think too often we don't talk about where we really want to go with these issues. And Ms. Thompson, I think it might have been a slip of the tongue, but, you know, you indicated you really would like to see national registration of all firearms within the, um, within the nation. Um, my question to you, though, is, you made a comment about registering vehicles or motor vehicles. Um, what state requires that you must register a car to own a car? I believe the state of California does. I mean, you and I are both from California, and, and I believe I registered my car, and that's because I had to. And, I, and when a police officer pulls me over and they ask for my registration, I believe I need to provide that. No, Ma'am, let me clarify. You do not re are we not required to register a car simply to own a car. You're required to register a car to operate that car on a public right-of-way. Ownership of a motor vehicle, motorcycle, car, tractor, whatever, is not regulated by the state for ownership. It is regulated for use on public right-of-ways. So there's a distinct difference here when we talk about this that from now on, just, I'm just saying as a local government guy, there is a huge difference. And I think now if you think about it, if you own a motorcycle that's just going to be used off-road, you don't have a registration, right? You don't have to license it then. But if you use it on the road, there's a distinct difference. And I would use a, 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 a fair comparison would be the fact that we do register and permit those who want to carry a firearm loaded on public, in the public. And so there is a distinct difference. So for in the future, I hope that when you bring this thing up, you think about the fact that to drive a car in California, on California roads, you're required to register it. But mere ownership is not a registration. Well, you know, I brought that up as an example of ways in which we as a society have balanced, you know, the, the risks to the, the, the rights of the individual against the risk to society. And, and we take steps in order to ensure that there's safety provisions, preventative safety provisions, and tracking in place. And certainly, um, I trust you are 100 percent correct about car registration. But so that you will, you will, from now on, when you, you know, there was a misspeak there, that to own a car, you don't have to have it registered. To drive it on a public street, you do that. If you say so, then I certainly am sure you're correct. By the way, in Indiana, it, it, it's, it's a little bit different. It's, uh, it, it's, if it's an operable vehicle, you do need to have it licensed and registered. But it's, it, there are distinctions. Usually it's because, specifically on a tax purpose, is yeah. that there is a personal property tax, and that is used to levy a tax. Well, I know in Indiana the concern is abandoned vehicles, too, on the streets that yeah. are inoperable. John, uh, well, see, and there yeah. you come back yeah. to. Yeah. On yeah. I'm, it's just <laughs> John, your. Your city sued the car, I mean, the, the um, manufacturers of the firearms because the ATF was not enforcing the law? Uh, what I was referring to, no, is, is gun dealers. We, uh, the New York City, along with many other cities, d does have a suit against manufacturers. However, what I would refer to in my testimony in the discussion here today was a suit against 27 gun dealers in five states. In, your, in five states? In five states. And you've got other activities against those who manufacture? Uh, we do have a pending suit against manufacturers that requires them to conduct a, basically a code of conduct which would require them to take notice of dealers who have high traces and continue to sell illegally. Are they violating the ATF regulations? Well, the dealers, uh, which is the suit I talked about, are absolutely violating. Okay, you said you're suing them because ATF's not doing the work. I'm talking uh, we're about suing the them actually, against gun What we're actually suing the dealers for um, is violating the law. All we're trying to do is enforce the law. And why are you, okay, you've got one group that are the dealers you're suing because they're violating the law. Are the gun manufacturers violating the law? The gun manufacturers we are, is a completely different ty type of suit. It's a suit where we're basically calling upon them to uh, take notice of illegal sell, sales practices and just adopt a, a code of conduct. Um, but when you talk about the dealers, what we are suing is 27 dealers who flagrantly uh, in, uh, sold uh, guns to straw purchases. Uh, they're on tape, caught red-handed, um, and uh, what we are only asking for is to enforce the law. Uh, 
That's all that we want to do. Uh, most gun dealers play by the rules. Most gun dealers are absolutely honest. But, that's, but that's breaking the law. We're getting back to this issue, though, that you have two sets of lawsuits now, and you're willing to defend one based on the fact that they're violating the law. And I went back and said, you got another one. That and I agreed. You're, 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 not, you're suing them because they make guns or because they're breaking the law. We are suing them because they are not taking notice. It's a civil suit, and they uh, have a response. Uh, it's a negligence action uh, based on the fact that they continue to supply guns to dealers who are breaking the law. Do you have that kind of lawsuit to uh, the manufacturers of alcoholic beverages? Um, uh, we actually do uh, certainly op uh, Beer, sting wine. operations all the time. Um, I meant the manufacturers, the national manufacturers of alcohol as opposed to... Uh, no, we don't, except for the, there's a big difference, which is the manufacturers actually know who are the illegal gun dealers. Oh, so they do, so they are breaking the law, you're saying? No, what I'm saying is they are on notice. Uh, you gave an example. Uh, I don't believe the manufacturers of Camel cigarettes knows when the corner bodega sells illegally to a minor. So you're saying, but, but, but there is no I question. I thought you said that the gun dealers weren't break, breaking the law. Now you're saying they are? You, they are knowingly breaking the law? The gun dealers are without a doubt breaking the law. No, but I meant the gun manufacturers. I'd them. say that the gun manufacturers are on notice that they continue to supply to dealers that are breaking the law. And all that we are seeking in that manufacturing suit, along with many other cities who have brought similar suits, is that they stop selling to is those. Is that against the law for them to make those sales? Um, I, it, is, it is a, uh, I think that it creates a nuisance. It creates a civil nuisance, and that is a colorable a claim civil, under okay, law. So that's it's a civil case. Civil as a nuisance. We are talking about civil cases. We've, we, absolutely. I would ask, uh, you're, you're a high-ranking individual in law enforcement and, uh, or in the city. Um, is New York City a sanctuary city for illegal immigrants? Absolutely not. And, and I'm not sure what relevance it has to today's testimony. Well, the activity of information sharing, the activity of focusing on certain deals, city of New York in the past has had major problems. I don't know what your status is at this time, but we've had open discussion about not having law enforcement cooperate with federal law enforcement, not sharing information with federal law enforcement over on one side. And I just feel it's really inconsistent for the city of New York, who has in the past said, we're not going to participate with the federal government on this issue because we're worried about privacy, we're worried about individual rights, we're worried about violation of some um, a, a segment of our population um, because it is so important to protect these individual rights and this privacy. And then on another issue for the same city to say it's ridiculous to worry about those, those um, uh, not sharing information, not, uh, it's ridiculous to worry about the privacy and moving it over. I but just got to say, John, I really see an inconsistency with the history. There, there would be an inconsistency if it were true, Congressman. However. Uh, let me tell you, because I've, in fact I've testified before Congress on this very issue, um, and it is certainly our policy to notify people when there have been criminal convictions. The problem is actually that the INS has, makes it extremely difficult to make these reports. And in fact, I wish I had actually a document from the INS which basically goes through step by step what instructions to INS officials uh, what they are to do when they receive a call from a local. And let me paraphrase it since I don't have it in front of me. Uh, the instructions go something like this. If you get a phone call from a local law enforcement agency trying to report that a uh, person um, who is undocumented has committed a crime, tell the caller that you should now write a letter. If they then follow that up and write a letter rather than making a phone call as instructed, you should then instruct them to have their supervisor write a letter. If they then write a letter, according, if the supervisor then writes a letter um, advising of the conviction or the arrest of somebody, uh, you should then, and I can't remember the next steps of it, you know, provide documentation. And so the problem really is 
that the INS has historically, and I want to be truthful, I don't know whether this has been changed, but historically has made it extraordinarily difficult for locals to do it uh, because, in fact, the INS has not wanted to enforce these laws. Well, I'm, I appreciate that um, that concern in the history of previous administrations, at least, and I would be interested to see what this administration looks at of cooperation with the federal government or specific direction to law enforcement that unless somebody has committed other crimes that um, individuals who were um, illegally present in the United States would not be um, apprehended or engaged by, by New York law enforcement. My biggest but, point is this, is the privacy issue needs to be addressed on both sides, but the consistency of law enforcement to say one issue we're going to be engaged in lawsuits and, mitigate, and, and litigation on the other side, we're basically going to be saying unless, unless one of our city laws are broken or state laws are broken, we're not going to be engaged. Gun uh, Gentlemen's time has expired. Let me just respond. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gun trace data Sir? only has crime data in it. So the only privacy Sir? that it is actually protecting is criminals. You know, the witness is out of order. I said the gentleman's time has expired. I appreciate your presence here, but I just appreciate you following the decorum of this committee. M Mr. Chairman. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. I want to thank this panel for its uh, presence. Can I submit something for the record? Uh, the Chairman? gentleman certainly can without objection. Uh, all members will have five days to uh, submit testimony. I want to thank each of the witnesses for being here. Uh, your presence is uh, very much appreciated, and I'm grateful for the testimony which you brought to this committee. Uh, this is the opening of a much longer discussion and your presence has helped to uh, ensure that we were able to make a, a positive beginning. Uh, so I'm going to dismiss the first panel and ask for the second panel to be ready. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah, it's all I don't care, whatever. <laughs> I'll sit by my name tag. <laughs> we are now going to move to our second panel of witnesses on uh, this Domestic Policy Subcommittee uh, entitled Lethal Loopholes, Deficiencies in State and Federal Gun Purchase Laws. Uh, I would now uh, ask the um, witnesses to, uh, first I'll introduce them. Uh, we have Rachel Brand. Rachel was, uh, Brand was confirmed as Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Policy of the United States Department of Justice on July 28, 2005. In her position, she manages the development of a variety of civil and criminal policy initiatives, the creation of departmental regulations, and the department's role in the confirmation of the president's judicial nominees. Her office also oversees legal policy for the ATF and the FBI. Before her current appointment, Ms. Brand worked in the Office of Legal Policy, principally on terrorism issues, served as an associate counsel to the president, and clerk for Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy. In addition to Ms. Brand, the Department of Justice has made Steve uh, Rubenstein, is that right, Rubenstein? Correct. 
the uh, ATF's chief counsel available to sit at the witness table and to respond to any questions members may have regarding the ATF's role in enforcing firearms law, including the Brady Act. Stephen Rubenstein was appointed chief counsel of ATF on S September 29, 2003. He serves as the principal legal advisor to the ATF's director and oversees legal services related to, among other laws, federal firearms and explosive laws. His office provides technical assistance to congressional committees and legislative drafting sessions, makes recommendations to the Department of Justice concerning litigation, and furnishes legal advice and assistance to other federal, state, and local agencies, including the Atter United States attorneys and Justice Department officials in the prosecution of ATF cases. Prior to becoming chief counsel, Mr. Rubenstein held the position of associate chief counsel for five years. It is a policy of this subcommittee and, and also of our, of our full committee, Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that the witnesses rise, uh, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Let the record reflect that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. As with panel one, I ask our witnesses give an oral summary of, uh, of each of their testimony. Keep the summary under five minutes in duration. Uh, I want you to keep in mind that your complete written statement will be included in the hearing record. Uh, Ms. Brand, you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Kucinich, Congressman Burton. I appreciate the opportunity today to talk about the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, or the NICS. The Brady Act required the Attorney General to establish a system that gun dealers can contact to determine whether a prospective gun dealer is, gun purchaser rather, is prohibited under federal or state law from buying a gun. The NICS is that system. The NICS has had a significant impact in preventing prohibited persons from buying guns from gun dealers. Since 1998, as you mentioned earlier, Chairman, over 75 million background checks have been processed by the NICS, and those checks have denied about 1.1 million gun transfers to persons prohibited from possessing firearms. The NICS has also gone a long way toward fulfilling the Brady Act's requirement that background checks be completed promptly so that lawful purchasers can buy a firearm without unreasonable delay. Currently, 92% of NICS checks are completed during the initial phone call, usually within a minute, and 95% of all checks are completed within two hours. The NICS is a computerized system that queries several national databases simultaneously, including what we call the III, which is a database of criminal history records, the NCIC, which includes, among other things, records of protection orders and wanted persons, and the NICS index, index itself, which includes other records that are relevant specifically to gun background checks. The effectiveness of the NICS in preventing gun transfers to prohibited persons depends directly upon the availability of records to the system. Although the Brady Act requires federal agencies to provide the NICS upon the Attorney General's request with information about those who are prohibited from buying firearms, states are not required to provide any information to the NICS. And so, to the extent that they do so, they do so voluntarily. To improve the availability of state records to the NICS, NCIC and III, the Brady Act established the NCHIP Federal Funding Program, which since 1996 has established, 1995 rather, has awarded over $500 million to the states. With the help of NCHIP, the states have come a long way in increasing the automation and accessibility of records to the federal databases. In addition to providing funding to the states, the FBI and the ATF have worked tirelessly since the inception of the NICS to encourage states to provide more records to the system. This outreach has included education of state officials about the NICS and about the contours and parameters of the federal firearms prohibitors and giving technical support to state agencies that hold the records. Specifically relevant to the Virginia Tech tragedy, both the ATF and the FBI have done outreach and provided education to states and encouragement to provide more mental health records to the NICS system. One of the most recent examples of that is a letter sent yesterday by ATF to all the states explaining the federal mental health prohibitor and offering to help the states determine whether their records meet the federal standard. And if we haven't already provided you with a copy of that letter, we will do so uh, after the hearing. ATF also plans soon to amend its form 4473, which is the form that a person fills out when they go to a gun dealer to buy a gun, to provide more information to prospective buyers about the parameters of the mental health disqualifier. Despite the department's efforts and the tremendous progress that has been made in improving the completeness of records available to the NICS, there are still significant shortcomings in the system. They include, for example, the fact that about half of III arrest records are missing final dispositions, and the fact that fewer than half of the states provide any mental health records to the NICS. Even those states that do provide records, only a handful of those provide any significant number of mental health records to the NICS. 
We are continuing our efforts to encourage the states to provide more information to the NICS, and several states are uh, inactive, uh, either actively engaging, either changing their law or in taking other efforts to provide more information to the NICS. So I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. I would like to note that federal firearms prosecutions are one of the department's top priorities. We, we take that very seriously through Project Safe Neighborhood. And I would note that since FY 2001, when Project Safe Neighborhood was stood up, we have charged over 71,000 defendants with gun charges. The number of prosecutions during the six years from FY01 to FY06 is more than twice the number of federal gun prosecutions that was brought in the previous six year period. And so I, I want the committee to know that we take enforcement of the gun laws very seriously. Thank you very much and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Uh, I thank the uh, gentlelady, uh, Mr. Rubenstein. I'm happy to be here, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, uh, you're going to be here just to answer questions? Okay, that was very brief. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now, Ms. Brand, in your written testimony, you outlined the amount of uh, data submitted into uh, NICS. But what is particularly important to establish here is how much data NICS would contain if the database were complete, and consequently, how much data is still missing kind of a continuation of the discussion from the last panel. Uh, and that's what I had asked your staff to prepare for this hearing. And I'm disappointed that it hasn't been produced yet. I, I don't know if, do you have it now? Are you asking um, how many records exist, for example, on mental health that we do not have? Is that what you're yeah, asking? I'm saying how much data is missing from your database? It's, it's really impossible for us to know that. To take the mental health disqualifier, for example, as was discussed in the first panel, under federal law, a person is prohibited from possessing or purchasing a gun if they've been adjudicated uh, by a court or other government agency as a danger to themselves or others as a result of mental illness, or if they've been involuntarily committed. Uh, we at the federal level have no way of knowing how many such persons are, are out there. So and in some states, it would be difficult for the state even to know right now because most of those adjudications or many of those adjudications will be made by state courts in all the different counties around the state with so no centralized. So what's the completeness of your, of your database then at NICS? We know that very few states provide significant numbers of mental health records to the NICS, and so we know that it is substantially incomplete. We just don't know the number, the total number that might be out there. So, well, I, you know, I'll get more specific. Let's say, including all the federal prohibited persons categories, what is the percentage of data that's been entered into the NICS database in a form that can be used in the Brady background check? Well, the best data that we have uh, concerns criminal dispositions, and my written testimony does provide a little bit more detail on that. Uh, we think about three out of four criminal records are available to the NICS, so about 75% are available to the NICS in some form. The main problem with criminal history records is that although the arrest record may go into the III at the beginning, less than half of those records have a final disposition in the system. And so if someone who had been arrested goes to buy a gun, uh, the NICS may see in the system that there was an arrest, but have no idea whether the person was actually convicted. Simply being arrested doesn't prohibit one from buying a firearm. Having been convicted of certain crimes does. And so then the NICS system would have to go and contact the state to find out what the final well, disposition was. Well, how deficient was. is that then with respect to state reporting with, uh, let's talk about criminal history. Well, we think we have, we think three out of four criminal records are in the system in some form, but only about 44% of those have final dispositions. What about mental health? We, we don't know what the total universe of mental health records is, and so we're unable to, to what do you, know. What do you have, though, in terms of the database? Do you have anything in the database? We, we know the total number of records that we have. We know how many states provide any records, which is 22 states provide any records, but many of those states have only provided maybe one or two records ever to the system. So, so you're saying that database, as far as with respect to mental health reporting, wouldn't be... Uh, is very incomplete. Right. And what about domestic violence records? Well, domestic, if you're talking about misdemeanor crimes of domestic violence, we believe that many of those are in the system. The difficulty there, though, is that uh, they would be provided to the III as a, you know, an assault charge, maybe. But the state wouldn't flag it necessarily as a crime of domestic violence. And so when a person goes to, to buy a gun, the NICS would have to take a look at the record and try to then contact the state and go behind it and figure out whether it was a crime of domestic violence or not. Uh, let's ex excluding domestic violence convictions, what percentage of conviction data 
that are relevant to the prohibited persons have been submitted by the federal government and the states to the NICS database? Well, the best information I have is that we have three out of four criminal records. I believe that includes both federal and state. Is that correct? And yes. in, your, in your written testimony, you state that fully one half of disp disposition data, that is data regarding whether an individual charged with a crime was ultimately convicted, is not currently in that uh, NICS database. So taking the deficiency of disposition data into account, uh, I'd like to uh, see if you'd want to re revisit uh, your estimate. I'm not sure I want to do the math on the fly, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, but we could, we could see if we can provide better information about the statistics to you after the hearing. The, the, uh, I, you know, actually, w we want to have that kind of a dialogue with you. But well, given it's 44% it's of 75%, I guess, whatever that is. Uh, because we have 75% of all criminal records, 44% of those have complete dispositions. That's my understanding. So that'd be about 33% or something like that. Okay, so I given I don't want to do the math on the I fly. don't know. It's just okay. So given your conclusion that the NICS database is deficient and substantially incomplete, in the testimony you heard from witnesses on the first panel that the pending legislation, the NICS Improvement Act, would improve the quantity and quality of data in NICS, uh, does the Department of Justice have a position on the NICS Improvement Act and uh, uh, H.R. 297 that provides both uh, what you could call a carrot and stick to states to report to NICS? Well, we support the bill's general aims of encouraging, provide a financial incentive to the, to the states to provide more information. We actually already do something similar through the NCHIP program that I mentioned in my testimony and that was discussed in more detail in my written testimony. We, most likely we'll have some technical comments on the bill and, and with respect to what the right dollar amount is, we haven't taken a position on that, but we certainly support its general aims. I, I thank uh, Ms. Brand, uh, Mr. Burton. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to clarify for the record um, because there was a statement made here, a testimony. Um, the City of New York was talking about the fact that they were sort of outraged that the uh, criminal activity was not being, information was not being shared with the City of New York when the um, uh, witness was asked about the sanctuary status for illegals in the New York, he uh, um, clearly said that there wasn't any. I would just like to record uh, to show that on September 22nd, uh, 03, Executive Order 41 was signed by the mayor, which said that any information pertaining to illegal immigration or that status is confidential and shall not be shared with you with um, federal immigration or federal officials. So I just want to make it clear that um, the testimony, I'm sure the individual meant well and did not realize that he misspoke. But the city of New York is and has been for a long time a sanctuary city. And I just think that when we talk about exchanging information about law breaking, um, not telling people who are criminals and who are not, that we should be consistent on this. And so I yield back, Mr. Chairman, uh, to the gentleman. I just have a couple questions, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to say to Ms. Brand, uh, the record that you spoke of just a minute ago is very, very good. And you're to be congratulated, in the, and uh, the Justice Department is to be congratulated on uh, uh, the, the, the record that's been compiled in dealing with these criminals and these people that break the law. So Thank you. I'll preface my, my questions with that. Well, well, I think the only question I really like to know the answer to is uh, you said that you generally uh, agree with the goals of the next legislation to uh, get additional information for the federal government to, to deal with these people. Do you have any idea the cost of, uh, to the states uh, to uh, garner the information on mental health records and also uh, from the courts, the convictions of uh, people that uh, uh, have been convicted of uh, felonies or other crimes? I've never seen a specific dollar amount about how much it would cost the states to get their, uh, to get their systems in a state that would allow them to provide all the mental health information. Uh, I will see if anyone at the department has that information. I do know that the Bureau of Justice Statistics, which is part of the Department of Justice, is in the process of doing a survey to the states to determine which of them don't provide mental health records because of resource limitations uh, and which of them don't provide mental health records for other reasons because there are a number of states that have state statutes and regulations that uh, prevent them from providing that information to the federal government. Well, uh, let me just say that uh, uh, 
the goals may be laudable, but the mandates to the states or the local or the cities throughout the country without funding from the federal government, unfunded, unfunded mandates are, are, are something that the state and local governments do not want. So if, if, if we're going to go down that path where you need additional information on mental health records or convictions, then we ought to find out the cost and we ought to make sure that the states don't bear that burden. In Indiana right now, our property taxes are so high already that uh, people are ready to march on the state house. So uh, uh, we want to make sure we don't add any more liabilities to the states without, uh, from the federal government with a mandate that's not going to be funded. Well, I agree. We, we would not support an unfunded mandate. My understanding is that the Nixon Improvement Act doesn't mandate states to provide the information, but it provides money to do it. And the NSHIP program, which exists now, provides grants every year to many states around the country to just help them. For example, if they don't have an automated system at all to collect the records, it would help them fund the creation of something like that, or it would help them uh, create the electronic systems to provide information electronically to the NICS. It, it assists them without requiring them to provide the information to the federal government. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I don't have any other questions. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, Ms. Brand, a July 2004 Department of Justice report found that most federally licensed firearm dealers are inspected infrequently or not at all. According to the former ATF director, the agency's goal is to inspect each FFL at least once every three years to ensure that they're complying with federal firearms laws. However, due in part to uh, resource shortfalls, the ATF is currently unable to achieve that goal. ATF uh, workload data show that the ATF conducted 4,581 fe uh, federally licensed firearm dealer compliance inspections in fiscal year 2002, or about 4.5 percent of the approximately 104,000 federally licensed firearm dealers nationwide. Uh, at that rate, it would take the ATF more than 22 years to inspect all federally licensed firearm dealers. Now, that's right from the uh, Department of Justice report. Uh, why is this the case, and is it still the case, and how can the ATF improve on its inspection performance? If you don't mind, I'd like to refer that question to Mr. Rubenstein, who's chief counsel of ATF. Mr. Rubenstein. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for the question. Um, ATF tries to target its resources to inspect those licensees to who come to our attention. The vast majority of licensees follow the rules and regulations, and it's not necessary that we inspect them very often. We try to target our investigations that to licensees who do come to our attention, either through local law enforcement or, or to our own undercover efforts to ensure that they are, in fact, complying with the rules and regulations. And so while we may not be able to inspect all the licensees as often as we might like, we try very hard to inspect those licensees who do need to be inspected to ensure that they are complying with the laws and regulations. How do you know, uh, they, how do you know who needs to be inspected and who doesn't if you have so few personnel? Well, we, we get that through targeting our inspections. Each field division has a plan in which it determines whether or not it's who it's going to inspect by talking with local law enforcement. Uh, undercover operations it may be using, um, random inspections that it, that it conducts. Um, over the years, we, we uh, look at trace data, obviously, and determine whether or not that might be a, a reason why we might look at a licensee. So we try very hard to target the resources we do have for those licensees. Our primary goal is to ensure that they are, in fact, complying with the law. When we go out to inspect the licensee, our goal is to ensure that they, are, they know what the regulations require and that they are, in fact, following those regulations. Here's what I'm wondering. I'm trying to square what you had to say with a former panel represented from New York City who said that they were able to identify 27 gun, uh, you know, licensed gun uh, dealers and, uh, and that they had to sue them to come into compliance. Um, did New York City do a better job than the ATF in the case of their sphere of operation? I'm not going to comment on whether New York City did a better job or were not. They, were I, they luckier with enforcement? Well, 
again, I, I'm not going to comment. We, we, we did look. They did send us some information about the 27 investigations, and in reviewing that, along with the United States attorneys, um, it was determined that there was not enough evidence to bring criminal actions at the federal level. But be that as it may, I think ATF has sets its priorities as to who it should inspect and, and I think uses its resources to its fullest capability to ensure that licensees are in fact complying with the, the, the federal farms laws. And I think as the first panel represented, and, as, and I think we all know, the vast majority of licensees are in fact uh, complying with the law. Well, you, you know, one of the things that you said, you said you didn't have enough, you know, there wasn't enough evidence. It's my understanding that New York City actually had uh, these gun dealers on tape. Were you aware of that? I was aware that there were some tapes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. I did not review the tapes. Uh, what, well, in terms of evidence, just for my information, uh, what, what standard of evidence does a tape does a tape provide? Is it a low standard? Is it a high, high threshold of evidence? Uh, I, I'm not in a position to, to testify about what was or was not on the tape or whether or not, not, not it met okay. whatever standard. Oh, All okay. I can tell you is that the United States attorneys who reviewed the tapes determined that it did not meet the standard for prosecution. Yeah, it, you know, I would just say that, that it was obvious, you know, with all due respect, Mr. Rubenstein, it was obviously enough evidence that the gun dealers voluntarily entered into a consent agreement that uh, dramatically changed the way in which they operated. I mean, I'm, I'm just pointing that out to you as someone who's uh, the counsel for. I understand. The department. You're, I understand. And I, again, I, I, won't, I can't this comment on that. This isn't a point of view. This is a point of law. Uh, I'm just saying it as far as whether or not it met a federal standard for prosecution is, is perhaps different than entering into a consent agreement with the private party. Does the DOJ support repeal of the T. Hart Amendment? Up, oh, saved by the bill. <laughs> <laughs> now you got 14 minutes. <laughs> uh, the, well, the, the answer is, is no. Um, the President's budget request contained language that was similar to the, the T. Hart Amendments. And uh, why not? I'm going to defer to Steve on that one. <laughs> We don't believe the TR Amendment impedes law enforcement. And, I, and over the last several weeks and perhaps months, there have been numerous articles and questions about the TR Amendment and what, what trace data can be uh, released and what can't be released. And, and what, what I want to say is that, you know, farms trace data is critically important uh, to, for, that's developed by ATF to assist state and local law enforcement in investigating and solving violent crimes. ATF traces approximately 280,000 firearms every year for approximately 17,000 law enforcement agencies around the country. Um, we consider that to be law enforcement sensitive information because it's often the first investigative lead in a case. And I can, if I can briefly explain what occurs, some, a police department will find a gun at a crime scene. They will ask ATF to trace it. We will trace that firearm for that local police department. That may be the last ATF hears about that, that trace. We will give that information to that local police department and assist them in any way possible to help investigate that, that crime. They, at some point, if they are asked by another law enforcement agency outside their jurisdiction, are free to disclose that information to any other law enforcement agency. In fact, there are multi-jurisdictional task forces in which trace data is disclosed. The concern for, from ATF, the historical concern predating the TR Amendment has been the release of trace information to other than the law enforcement agency who recovered a firearm because the concern would be if it's released to third parties, it could help criminals evade detection. Mm -hmm. It could interfere with undercover operations. It could interfere with ongoing state investigations that were being uh, pursued. But, but ATF's primary goal, one of its primary goals under the Gun Control Act is to assist state and local law enforcement in their fight against crime. And I think it, it, the TR Amendment does, I don't believe, we don't believe does, does anything to stop ATF or to in, impede ATF in assisting the states in that fight. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Issa, do you have yeah, just, uh, questions? Just following up on that, can we all agree that the two biggest challenges we face today is, in fact, making sure that all persons, whether mentally defective, criminal in the background, illegally in this country, need to 
B on a 50-state basis, plus the territories, excluded from being able to purchase guns. That's a fair, fair broad statement. Well, federal law already prohibits the categories of people you just mentioned. Right, from except, possessing except guns. in fact, Virginia Tech shows us that we have not yet successfully implemented those existing laws. There are significant gaps. There are significant right. number of records that are not in the NIC system. That is true. Right. And, and the reason for my question, we are an oversight and reform committee. And, and it's actually very good that we are, because our job is to say, in many ways, are the existing laws sufficient? And is it an absence of implementation? Is it a defect in the law? Or is it, in fact, if you will, bureaucracies that are in the way? And it appears as though we do have a state cooperation and uh, information sharing problem, state and local. And that, that has to be worked on, and some of it will have to be consistent with the Constitution. It will have to respect the states, but encourage the states. The second and obvious one is when, when, and I think Mr. Bilbray brought this up earlier, we have a challenge in that we have 12 million illegals in this country. They represent in California nearly half of all the people who are incarcerated in our prisons, and they represent a huge part of the gun crime. So we have a federal issue that would appear to be not fully uh, taken care of. And then the last one, and Mr. Rubenstein, you, I think you were hitting on it, we do have a mandate to track weapons from womb to tomb and, in fact, to provide law enforcement the ability to get the information necessary in criminal prosecutions. And I, if I heard you right, basically you're saying you're reasonably satisfied that you're going that direction. And I, and I want to make sure I give you a chance to say whether or not you believe that is as big a problem as the state and local cooperation and the federal implementation of persons who should not be able to purchase, which is clearly this committee has, has it, it, we, didn't even, we didn't even meet and we knew we had a problem there. I, 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 if I understand your question correctly, I think that's correct. Okay, so, you, but your, you know, your satisfaction level is relatively high. So, as to release of information to state yes. and local law enforcement, yes, sir. So if, if, and hopefully we'll get unanimity here, if we were to focus most narrowly to get the most effectiveness from this committee's energies and time, both in oversight and potential legislation we might introduce, although it wouldn't, probably wouldn't come back to this committee, it would be referred to another committee, we should work on things which would allow or encourage or bring about 50 state cooperation and compliance with the individuals, the groups that I mentioned that are prohibited from gaining firearms. If, if I understand what you're saying, yes. I mean, it has been a goal of the department since NICS was stood up in 1998 to constantly increase the number of records the state's put into the system. Now, we can't constitutionally force them to do that, but we, it's not as though we just woke up after Virginia Tech and started encouraging them to do it. We've been encouraging them to do it for years. And right, so, and, yes. and if you were here on an earlier panel, I made the point that this president has clearly made it a priority for the U.S. attorneys, this attorney general and his predecessor have, for gun crime enforcement, even where it wasn't necessarily popular, has made the point that U.S. attorneys have to do a substantial amount of that. But circling back again, as you all know, the power of Congress uh, in interstate commerce and other areas has been used. The highway uh, implementation, we were able to get states to all go to 55. We wanted to go to 55. We were able to get them to go to 21 for the, uh, uh, the age of drinking when we wanted to. We have ways of encouraging states to do certain things and to comply. We certainly have tremendous amounts of dollars that come from the federal government to, to provide law enforcement tools, and we can reasonably expect that if they don't want that money, they can choose not to cooperate. If they do want that money, we can hook perfectly constitutionally that they shall comply with certain aspects of enforcement. The question is, is that the best use for this committee? And if it is, what recommendations could you make to us for tools to do it, or more importantly, where we should first put our priority within that major group of, uh, of non-compliance non with making sure that certain groups or individuals do not get weapons? 
Well, we have, we already have the NCHIP funding program, which the president uh, funds in his budget request every year. Um, Congress actually has funded the NCHIP program at lower levels than the president's budget request for the last several years running. And for the last two fiscal years, that program has been funded at only $10 million when the budget request has been around $50 million. And so, you know, $10 million is really not that much money to parcel among all the, parse out among the 50 states to help um, improve their systems. And so, we certainly support improving systems that way. Now, the NCHIP program, to the extent that it's funded, has priority areas to encourage the states uh, in their grant applications to, um, that, to focus on those areas. And one of those areas is improving mental health records uh, provision into the system. And so that's something that and the criminal records dispositions are two of the priority areas that NCHIP program focuses on. Thank Excellent. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Time has expired. Uh, Mr. Burton. I have no questions. Thank you. Okay. I want to thank uh, this panel for appearing. Uh, this committee will submit uh, questions in writing, and we would appreciate your response so that we can complete the, um, uh, our work for this particular hearing. And I want to thank you for your presence here. And My pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we're thank, going thank to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We're going to uh, recess uh, for two votes. And I think we'll probably be back here in about, about uh, 25 minutes to a half hour, at which time we would ask the third panel to join us. Uh, this committee stands in recess. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the witnesses. The committee will come to uh, order again. Uh, this is the third panel of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee's hearing on lethal loopholes, deficiencies in state and federal gun purchase laws. We've heard from uh, panels who uh, represent the legal community against violence, the Brady Campaign Against Handgun Violence, a criminal justice coordinator for New York City, and Assistant Attorney General of Legal Policy, U.S. Department of Justice, and the Chief Counsel of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. Uh, this third panel uh, consists of witnesses from uh, uh, Johns Hopkins University, University of Pennsylvania, and from the National Alliance, <clears throat> National Alliance on Mental Illness, Susan Sorensen, Professor Sorensen is a professor of social policy and criminology at the University of Pennsylvania and part of the graduate group in public health. Since 1986, she has taught a graduate course at UCLA and Penn in family and sexual violence. Professor Sorensen has published widely in the epidemiology and prevention of violence, including homicide, suicide, sexual assault, child abuse, battering, and firearms. She was a member of the National Academy of Sciences Panel on Research on Violence Against Women, a consultant to UNICEF's May 2000 Report on Domestic Violence Against Women and Girls, and a member of the advisory panel for the 2001 U.S. Surgeon General's Report on Youth Violence. Uh, we will also hear from uh, Professor Daniel Webster, who is an associate professor of health policy and management at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where he serves as co-director of the Center for Gun Policy and Research and associate director of research for the Center for the Prevention of Youth Violence. Professor Webster has published numerous articles on firearm policy, youth gun acquisition and caring firearm injury prevention, intimate partner violence, and adolescent violence prevention. He is currently leading studies, uh, uh, leading studies that evaluate policies to reduce illegal gun sales. Uh, he's leading a community gun violence prevention initiative and an intervention designed to encourage protective measures for victims of domestic violence. And finally, uh, Mr. Ronald Honberg. 
Mr. Hanberg is the National Director for Policy and Legal Affairs at the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI. During his 18 years with NAMI, he has worked on issues affecting people with mental illnesses involved with criminal justice systems, including jail diversion, correctional treatment, and community reentry, and has drafted amicus curiae briefs on precedent-setting mental health litigation before coming to NAMI. Mr. Hanberg worked as a vocational rehabilitation counselor for the state of Maryland and in a variety of direct service positions in the mental illness and uh, developmental disabilities field. It is the policy of the Committee of Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that the witnesses please stand, uh, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record show that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. As with panel two, I will ask you to give an oral summary of your testimony and to keep this summary under five minutes in duration. Bear in mind, your complete written statement will be included in the hearing record. Uh, we will begin with Professor Sorensen. Thank you for the invitation to be here today. And I begin with good news. The number of homicides committed by an intimate partner has dropped during the past 30 years. Also, the proportion of intimate partner homicides that were committed with a gun has dropped in the past 30 years. However, one bit of information remains disturbingly constant, and that is that women are more than twice as likely to be shot by a male intimate as they are to be shot, stabbed, strangled, bludgeoned, or killed in any other way by a stranger. When it comes to firearms, much of what the discussion tends to focus on fatalities. But a, fi but a firearm does not have to be fired to have an impact. It can be used to intimidate and to coerce an intimate partner to do what the abuser wants. An estimated 4 million U.S. women have been threatened with a gun by an intimate partner. And nearly 800,000 have had an intimate partner use a gun against them. It would be as if every woman in Washington, D.C., Boston, San Francisco, Chicago, Los Angeles, Miami, Hartford, Columbus, Indianapolis, Salt Lake City, Albany, Rochester, Syracuse, Buffalo, Milwaukee, Richmond, and Des Moines had at least once in her life an intimate partner use or threaten to use a gun against her. Congress has passed two pieces of legislation that are relevant here. And I'll reiterate what we heard earlier today. The 1994 Violent Crime Control and Enforcement Act expanded the list of persons who are prohibited from possessing a firearm to include those against whom a domestic violence restraining order has been issued. And then in 1996, the Lautenberg Amendment, by which persons convicted of a domestic violence misdemeanor are prohibited from purchasing and possessing a firearm. Now, responsibility, as we have heard, for how the laws were implemented was left to the individual states. Some states already had laws in place and databases against which to purchase and against which purchase applications could be checked. Others have yet, more than a decade later, to develop such capacity. This is important because each year about a million people in the United States obtain a restraining order against an intimate partner. Persons who come, against, come under a domestic violence restraining order likely are the single largest class of new prohibited purchasers each year. Reports by the Bureau of Justice Statistics indicate that about one out of every seven firearm transfer applications were denied due to domestic violence. Many more, however, are not denied because the information about the domestic violence is not available, it's not made available, or it's not easily accessed. The purchase prohibitions are more easily addressed than possession prohibitions. Although persons under a domestic violence restraining order are required to relinquish their firearms, very few do. I offer 
several recommendations in my written testimony, and I'll just focus on a couple here. And first is that states should implement, maintain, and monitor the quality of an electronic database for all domestic violence restraining orders and misdemeanors. And the data should be submitted uh, so that it can be part of NICS. Work of the states is essential so that the intent of the federal law is met. Therefore, some sort of incentive might be useful to speed quality compliance. We heard earlier from some of the other speakers are concerned about requiring states to do the work of the federal government. And I was thinking about that a bit over the one of the breaks. And it's not that I'd like to ask the question compared to what? Because if the states don't do this, they are going to be picking up the costs for the incarceration and the prosecutions when the guns remain in the hands of those who should not be having the guns. So it's not a zero-sum game because the costs are still going to be borne by the states and local municipalities, but the issue is how those get spent. Personally, I would rather see them spent in prevention. Second, a federal agency should monitor the amount and quality of the data that is submitted to NICS and should issue periodic reports on these findings. There are concerns specific to these records. Um, and I can expand on that, and they merit very close monitoring until there is more complete compliance. And there will be perhaps some that won't comply. We know um, death certificates, for example, that are submitted to the National Center for Health Statistics. My understanding is that's a voluntary process that the states participate in. And so the feds have figured out how to make this work and how to get voluntary compliance. There's one state, I believe, that still does not comply to, and doesn't submit their death certificate records. Um, but federal agencies do know how to monitor the data that they get, to have a good sense of whether these are underestimates, and to make sure of the quality of the records that they do receive. Next, we need models and guidelines for firearm relinquishment and removal. It would be great if we could have allocations to an appropriate federal agency so that we can convene key stakeholders from around the country to develop guidelines to ensure compliance with federal law. And lastly, consideration should be given to whether firearm pro prohibition should be extended to related circumstances. I think specifically of former dating partners, as was earlier pointed out already, is not covered under federal law, and also to stalking. Stalking is a situation in which you have someone who becomes obsessed with another, and even though there may not be any relationship, they perceive a relationship or they want a relationship. And when attempts to make contact are not met, are, not, um, are rebuffed, the person can develop motivation for wanting to harm the other, and it should it'd be important to make sure that we don't allow them to have the means. So in summary, there is useful, relevant legislation already in place. Some expansion of dating partners and stalking merits consideration. But mostly, however, you've passed laws that need to be implemented and enforced. And by making a few other changes, you can help bring your intent into reality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sorensen. Uh, we'll next hear from Professor Webster. You may proceed. And, and keep that mic close and make sure it's on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've submitted my written testimony. I'm going to uh, try to just cover some highlights of there. Um, basically, the general objectives of uh, most gun control laws, federal, state, or local, um, are actually well founded in science. Uh, violence is not a random phenomenon. Uh, there are predictors, and prior criminal offending uh, and problems with mental health are factors that a number of studies have shown to be associated with uh, risk for violence. Um, there's frankly little disagreement about the general objectives of these basic policies. Um, but the reason I guess we're here is there, there's a huge disconnect between the objectives of the policies and whether the current laws are adequate or are being enforced adequately. Um, I'd like to focus uh, first on whether our criminal history uh, restrictions are really adequate to address uh, the objective, again, of trying to keep guns from dangerous people. 
Um, Professor Sorensen mentioned the exclusions that were put into place in the 1990s for domestic violence offenders. Um, aside from that uh, prohibition, that's, uh, we prohibit felons. Uh, but the question is, is that really the appropriate bar we want to set for someone uh, as long as you've been able to uh, avoid getting a felony conviction or a, a conviction for uh, domestic violence, then you can have as many guns as, as you like. Um, there's uh, precious little research, I'm very sorry to say, to tell us enough about the adequacy of these current standards. There is, however, one study that looked at homicide offenders in the state of Illinois what that study found was that 57 percent, while the offenders uh, typically had very long criminal histories, uh, 57 percent of those did not have a felony conviction. So we're clearly missing a lot of criminal offenders by setting the bar at felony. Uh, there's been research done in California that showed that individuals with misdemeanor convictions have uh, elevated risk for future violence. Those who are going to purchase firearms uh, and have uh, prior misdemeanor convictions are seven times more likely to commit future violence, uh, crimes of violence and firearms related crimes than are uh, individuals who don't have those kind of convictions. Uh, California changed its policies in the early 1990s to deny violent misdemeanors, firearms, um, and what further research showed is that those who were denied um, were significantly less likely to reoffend than were individuals uh, with similar arrest histories prior to them adding the new misdemeanor restrictions. So I think that's an important area to, to really uh, fully achieve our objective of keeping guns from uh, criminals and dangerous individuals. Um, another category of criminal offense that is not adequately addressed in federal law and in most, not most, uh, in 23 states is uh, offenses committed while the offenders were juveniles. If those same offenses had been committed by an adult, they would have been prohibited from uh, being able to purchase a firearm when they are of age. Um, criminal offending as a juvenile, particularly if that offending is serious or chronic, is very strongly re related to adult offending. Um, so that is another area in which to achieve our objectives of uh, keeping guns from dangerous people, uh, we could expand those kind of exclusion criteria. Um, I want to sort of, uh, I see that my time is is about over, but I want to mention that with respect to the TR amendment, uh, many good points were made about the re uh, effects that that has on local law enforcement. I want to say as a researcher, it also impedes the kind of work that I've done to inform uh, gun violence prevention efforts. And a study that we published last year showed that prior, when, when the data were more available, did not have the TR restrictions, uh, and it was discovered that a gun dealer just outside of Milwaukee was a leading seller of crime guns. When that was made public, that dealer voluntarily changed some, uh, his sales practices, and our research showed that the rate at which his guns went into the criminal commerce re reduced by more than 70%. We got more recent data through um, the assistance of the Milwaukee Police Department and found that post TR, when the data were not readily available and basically gun dealers could do what they want, uh, the problem went exactly back to where it was before the gun dealer was revealed as having problems with his sales practices. So I think that aside from simply helping uh, uh, address a very specific criminal case. There's also the issue of having data available to researchers and the public so uh, people will be more accountable. Thank you, for, uh, Professor Webster. I uh, will now hear from Mr. Hanberg. You may proceed. 
Thank you, Chairman Kucinich. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here today on behalf of NAMI, which is a grassroots advocacy organization comprised of people with serious mental illness and their families. Um, I would like to say at the outset that NAMI very much supports efforts to prevent violent or potentially violent individuals from possessing firearms, and we thank you for the opportunity to help guide the committee's inquiry towards that end. In the wake of the Virginia Tech tragedy, many questions have been raised about how someone like Mr. Cho could have been allowed to purchase handguns. The real lessons uh, of the, the tragedy, however, lie in the failed mental health system. Although we realize this hearing's focus is on our gun laws, uh, it's equally important to recognize that timely and appropriate treatment might well have prevented that tragedy. Uh, with respect to the gun laws, I would like to make three basic points. Um, First, uh, there has been a, the suggestion today that, that the regulations guiding reporting of mental health information are clear. Um, we don't think that the, the, that the guidelines in the, in the Brady regulations are sufficiently clear, and that may be part of the problem. For example, the term that's used to describe mental illness is adjudicated as a mental defective. That term needs to be changed. It's both stigmatizing and incompatible with modern terminology used in the diagnosis and treatment of people with mental illness. And it also creates significant uncertainty over who is and who is not covered under the law. The regulations implementing the Brady Law attempt to define this term, but for reasons enumerated in detail in my written testimony, this definition is still very unclear. No state official charged with carrying out the requirements of the Brady Bill could possibly know what this means, as it is a term that's been obsolete for close to 40 years. And just as we wouldn't use the term idiot or imbecile, in federal law, so too should we not use the term adjudicated as a mental defective. Second, as I stated at the outset, we support efforts to prevent violent or potentially violent individuals from possessing firearms. However, mental illness should not be a proxy for violence. Current research, including the findings of the landmark Surgeon General's report on mental health in 1999, strongly demonstrate that the overwhelming majority of people with mental illness are not violent. Research does show that a small subset of people with mental illness may pose higher risks of violence, and predictors include a past history of violence, non-participation in treatment, and co-occurring abuse of illegal drugs or, or alcohol. Uh, the NICS reporting system needs to be based on these kind of clear risk factors. One model to consider for reporting is that under California law, which is categories that directly link to violence or potential violence. It's also important to keep in mind that other categories included in the NICS database are more directly linked with violence. For example, as, as you've heard, court orders that restrain individuals from harassing, stalking, or threatening an intimate partner or child of an intimate partner, and misdemeanor convictions for domestic violence are included. Uh, these categories are probably more directly relevant to potential violence than mental illness per se. And so we believe that efforts must be made at the federal level incorporating expertise from the National Institute of Mental Health and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration to develop clear reporting criteria and mechanisms that are linked to violence, not solely to mental health treatment. Finally, NAMI believes that standards uh, must be developed in federal law to protect the privacy of information provided to the NICS system. We're very concerned that, that concerns about the inappropriate disclosure of sensitive information about mental health treatment may be a significant impediment for people with mental illness to seek help when they need it. Representative McCarthy has included a provision in H.R. 297, the NICS Improvement Act, which we've heard um, referenced a number of times today, requiring the publication of regulations by the Attorney General for protecting the privacy of information provided to the system. And this would indeed be a positive step. But we, we believe these regulations must specify that only names and addresses should be included in the NICS system. Um, I heard today that that's in fact the case. That's not very well known to the public. Uh, with no further information about, about why a person is on the list. The law should also prohibit sharing the list with any federal or state agency or individual for any other purpose. And privacy protections should apply to all agencies and individuals responsible for collecting and providing information for the NICS system. In conclusion, um, as I've said, we support efforts to prevent violent individuals from possessing firearms in accomplishing this laudable goal. It's very important to establish criteria that achieve this objective without inadvertently subjecting people with mental illness to further stigma and prejudice, which can deter people from seeking treatment when they need it the most. Therefore, NAMI recommends a regulatory process that incorporates current scientific knowledge and brings clarity to this very, very complex issue. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Heinberg. Uh,
Professor Sorensen, one of your recommendations is extending the purchase pro prohibitions to those who stalk former dating partners. Could you explain why the prohibition should be expanded to include those individuals? I believe it should be um, I believe it should be expanded to both former dating partners and stalking, um, regardless of the relationship, whether there was a prior relationship or, or not. Um, people who are in the public eye are sometimes uh, stalked by others, and um, that kind of obsessive quality of wanting to have a relationship with someone is and, and then to not have that be met uh, can be very disappointing. And then the person can sometimes become violent. Um, so I don't think that there should be the firearms provision. There should be discussions about whether it should be extended to all cases in which stalking has been there and that there's a restraining order in place where a judge has already or a commissioner has already decided that this person constitutes a credible threat to this other person. Um, so that it goes through the regular due process, but I think it should be extended there. And also, um, I believe it's former boyfriends and girlfriends, or maybe it's boyfriends and girlfriends in general, are those who are at highest risk of um, intimate partner homicide. And so it seems like we'd want to include that group in this protection under federal law about domestic violence restraining orders. Do you see any wisdom in allowing states to adopt more stringent laws to see what works and how to balance rights, or do you think that we know enough now to establish uniformity at a federal level uh, for the expanded categories that you've discussed? Several states have already had these in place. California has had these in place for uh, quite some time, and this information is entered into the system that California uses to check for background checks and for purchases. Um, so there's evidence that it's already working, um, or at least it can be implemented is a better way to put it. Tell me more about the, uh, that who you work for in terms of the statistics that you gather and the policy recommendations that you make. Okay. Um, this has been a content area of, for me, for my research for a number of years. And I also had the privilege of serving on a Attorney General, this is for the state of California, uh, former Attorney General Bill Lockyer, his uh, policy committee, it was a task force. And one of the things that we looked into was whether firearms prohibitions were being enacted appropriately and were being enforced mm -hmm. correctly. And we were surprised to find that there were a number of counties that were, as we put it, under-reporting, that we would have expected far more restraining orders from them than we were getting. And sometimes it was because they weren't entering them, sometimes because the judges had crossed their prohibitions off on restraining orders, um, and sometimes because they lacked personnel to do it. And when it was brought to the attention from the state attorney general to the local DAs and such and the local police officers and the persons who were responsible for that, they changed practices. And so simply letting them know that we're paying attention and we're going to be monitoring this brought them quickly into compliance on some things. And I think federally, if we know that that's going to happen and that's happening on a federal level, it'd be great. We have fewer than one million restraining order records in NICS right now. There should be lots more than that. Thank you very much. Now, Professor Webster, the ways that the laws are designed now the prohibited categories at the federal level and at the state level are mostly permanent. You do mention the case that some states restore firearm privileges at age 30 if juvenile offenders have disqualifying adult violations. Uh, should this happen for other categories? I'm not, I'm not sure if I get the question. Uh, so the, the question is whether uh, some prohibitions might be t uh, time limited? Is that the idea? Okay. Um, I think if it's a matter of not having the, if that's the only way you can get the restrictions, I think it makes a lot of sense. 
we do know a fair amount about development or developmental trajectories for criminal offending. And uh, typically, if there's no offending during the early adult years, it's pretty darn rare that they're going to be a problem later. So, so, for example, if a person is convicted of a felony or domestic violence misdemeanor as a young man or woman, uh, would they be a demonstrated risk purchasing a handgun in their 50s when their record is otherwise immaculate? Um, it would be an un unusual set of circumstances. I'm not saying there's no risk. Is there any social science there at all? Um, I don't know of a very specific study that examined exactly that, but uh, I'll just say that it, it's a, it would be an unusual um, set of circumstances. Uh, I'm, I have a question for both you and for Mr. Hanberg. Um, are there any good studies that show what classes of mentally ill people are likely to commit a crime, or specifically whether the federal definitions of mentally defective uh, and committed to a mental institution are based on sound social science, Professor Webster? I have not been able to find a study that would define the uh, mental health problems in the way that the federal law does. I think Mr. Hanberg was right on in saying that uh, sort of the definitions and how we define that doesn't line up with how uh, scientists and clinicians tend to do that kind of thing. So there's really nothing to go on to say for sure whether those set of criteria really are logical. Uh, I do agree with uh, what he was saying earlier that um, there's certainly a number of very seriously mental, mentally ill people who might be technically disqualified, but who probably really are not a threat. On the other hand, there's certainly a number of individuals with mental health conditions that research shows um, does elevate risk. Uh, so. Mr. Hanberg. Yeah, no, there, there certainly have not been any studies that I have seen that have looked specifically at the relationship between mental illness and the likelihood to, of, um, of committing you know, a violent act with a gun. But there have been studies that have looked at mental illness and violence, a number of them, and uh, some recently uh, published. And as I said, the risk factors that have been identified, with the caveat that the overwhelming majority of people are not uh, violent, um, it, are, are if the person is not receiving treatment, um, if the person has engaged in violence in the past, and if the person is engaging in what's known as a, the co-occurring use of alcohol or substance abuse. I will say that a lot of the categories that are in the federal law don't seem to have, seem to have a fairly tenuous link with violence. Involuntarily committed may be, one, one, may be legitimate if the basis of the commitment is on the basis of being dangerous to self or others. But we know that there are many people who are involuntarily committed who are uh, committed for other reasons that have nothing to do with violence. We also know that included in the federal def definition potentially are people who may have been found at one time or another to be incompetent and to manage their, for example, their money for a temporary period of time, were assigned a guardian, but after a period of time re were regained their competence. And, and um, we, we also know that the recovery from mental illness is very possible these days and that people can go from a time when they may not have been doing well to 20 or 25 years of, of, of uh, you know, independence and productivity. So the idea of having a durational uh, 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 limit or you know, some criteria in law makes sense to us. And interestingly, California, which actually has a definition that in some respects is broader than the federal definition, um, but, but also has ways, has, has durational limits. Uh, you know, in one category, five years. Uh, in another category, when the person regains their competence. Um, and also has m procedures in place that would enable people to petition to have their name taken off the list makes sense to us. Well, obviously, every, everyone you know, who may have at one time or another suffered from mental illness is not uh, necessarily violent. Now, do, do you have any, uh, any comment based on your study or analysis of the uh, individuals involved in that uh, tragedy at, at Blacksburg? 
Uh, and I don't, I, don't th I don't think we know enough yet about Mr. Cho to know what his diagnosis was. What we do know is that there were some, uh, you know, based on the media stories that have come out, that there were some telltale signs. I mean, he was actually uh, held in, on an involuntary basis on a 72-hour hold in a hospital. Um, he was released on strict conditions that he be, ba he, be uh, he participate in outpatient treatment. He was actually committed on an outpatient basis to outpatient treatment. And um, there was clear language in that commitment order that said he was potentially dangerous to self or others. And then two years passed and before the tragedy occurred. And the last thing I want to do is play Monday morning quarterback here, but this was somebody where there was clear notice that, that he was potentially at risk. And what happened, as happens time and time again, is that the mental health system didn't do its job. Um, didn't provide him with the services that he needed. There was no coordination between the court and the mental health system. So he basically went without treatment for two years and his symptoms, it appears, only got worse. Um, so in a situation like that where there was actually a finding of, of potential dangerousness, we would have no problem with a person uh, under that circumstance going on the list at least for a period of time until the dangerousness is abated. Anyone else on the panel want to comment on that one? or? Okay, uh, I, I would uh, like to ask Professor uh, Webster, you wrote that there is little evidence that policies prohibiting the seriously me mentally ill from possessing firearms play a role in determining whether individuals seek care for their mental illness, and you cite a um, 2001 study. Can you explain this study? Uh, it was a study that um, was a survey and asked individuals the reasons uh, individuals with uh, mental health problems and they uh, asked simply what are the reasons that you did not seek care. Um, the study did not reveal any responses that indicated that they did not seek care because they were concerned about uh, being on a list that would prohibit them from purchasing firearms, uh, only f you, say uh, they they, were, you say they were or weren't. Were, were not. There, there was no uh, no responses reported in that study that had anything to do with that. The only thing that was even remotely close to that was that 14 percent, 14 percent, excuse me, said that they did not seek treatment due to um, issues of stigma around that, and if. Uh, the, the degree to which we um, conflate criminality with mental health, uh, that of course creates the stigma. But, but that's, you know, a few, that's a little bit removed. Um, so I, I think that the, the general objective of keeping firearms from, uh, you know, basically, I'm in agreement with Mr. Homburg that there is a set of individuals with mental illnesses that at least temporarily are going to be potentially dangerous and, um, and that by restricting access to firearms should not be a barrier, will not be a barrier to them see, uh, getting care. Do you have a comment, Mr. Homburg? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I think we're in, we're in agreement uh, and certainly on the point that we need to try to identify the people who are at risk and make sure that they don't get firearms. But um, I, I do have to, I do want to emphasize just how pervasive the, the stigma that people with mental illness face and how uh, even the perception that your name may go on a list. People worry all the time about um, sensitive information about their mental health records being disclosed and adverse consequences as a result. And I'll, I'll just give you an example that I think uh, You've, you I'm sure have heard before that a lot of people when they need mental health treatment and if they're fortunate enough to have private insurance oftentimes choose not to not choose to, to not to seek reimbursement through their private insurance for fear that somehow the information that they receive that treatment will be disclosed and that there'll be adverse consequences in terms of losing their jobs or you know impacting on their social relationships so I think we Again, my point, I guess, is that we have to be very, very careful about this, and we certainly can't be careful enough in, in, in terms of the privacy protections that we put in place for people. Uh, you know, that uh, raised a question. The, um, uh, one of the uh, early panelists today uh, in uh, testimony stated the following. 
FBI data indicate that a small fraction of the number of Americans who have been involuntarily committed in mental institutions has been reported to the NICS. As of no November 30th, 1999, the FBI had received from all states a total of only 41 records of mentally ill persons. Although the number of mental health records provided to NICS has increased, in 2003 there were more than 143,000, mental, uh, mental illness remains significantly underreported. And as a result of the FBI's lack of information about mentally ill persons, it cannot be assured that an FBI background check will find that a person is ineligible to possess a firearm due to mental illness. So that's that kind of a quandary. And the, the, the question that you raise about uh, just the reporting, so if someone's involuntarily committed, uh, let's say they have a you know, nervous breakdown because of the loss of a loved one. Um, <laughs> You know, is this kind of the kind of concerns that you're? Well, I, I, I would say, you know, just addressing broadly the, the, the question of why so many names aren't being reported, I, I think there are two reasons for that. And, and, and I think in the process of giving you those two reasons, I'll get it, at, you know, your question. Uh, first, I, I have to make the point that a lot of states don't do a very good job of keeping data. We did a report last year. We, we did a report, national report card on states, and we found that a number of states couldn't even provide you with an unduplicated count of people that they served in their mental health system, um, you know, on a, on a given in a given year. So I, that clearly, the, the te technology has to be improved. But I also get back to the point I made in my testimony, which is that the def definition is is really vague and unclear. And I don't think that states really understand who they're supposed to report and who they're not supposed to report. And um, that's why I think it's very important to revisit the definition at this point. And um, you know what Representative McCarthy is trying to accomplish in her legislation is, is very important. Uh, and we support her goals. But uh, there's an aversion, perhaps for understandable reasons, based on what I heard earlier today, to reopen the Brady Law and to reopen the regulations. But I really think when it comes to the definition of who with mental illness should be reported and who shouldn't. It's important to do that. And that's really what we're pushing for as an organization. Thank you very much. Um, one of the things I want to comment on that um, in this discussion about the uh, gun violence and the reporting of statistics, and of course your presence here is to talk about the role of mental illness as one of the reporting categories. One of the things that occurs to me is the fact that uh, we're still struggling with the issue of mental health parity in this country and making sure that those who are mentally ill have access to the health care services that they need on an equal basis to people with other types of illnesses. Uh, John Conyers and I have produced a bill, H.R. 676, the uh, universal single-payer not-for-profit health care bill, that among other areas, provides for fully covered mental health. And uh, that would be one way in which we would have a chance to look at uh, those issues in a much more detail and provide the kind of care that people obviously need. Um, and, and with respect to Professor uh, Sorensen uh, and, and to uh, Professor Webster, your familiarity with uh, various types of violence and their relationship to uh, to crimes of violence using implements like guns. Um, you may be familiar with another proposal, H.R. Uh, 808, to create a cabinet level Department of Peace and Nonviolence, which uh, looks specifically at the issues that both of you have talked about, uh, domestic violence, spousal abuse, child abuse, violence in schools, gang violence, gun violence related to that, racial violence violence against gays, police community um, uh, conflicts, and creates an organized approach to dealing with it based on, you know, really reaching out to professionals such as yourself to get that expertise and get it into solid programs that work either with existing groups or work with the educational system to teach, uh, teach nonviolence and, and uh, uh, nonviolent conflict resolution at, a, at an early age. So, um, you know, as I'm listening to your testimony, I I'm thinking about how a new model essentially could be constructed to 
look at the problems that are pre that were presented with today, which are basically quantitative, in effect, trying to get the, the data to try to you know determine what do we where do we go from here. But even be, even even as we do that, it's still possible to look at creating other models that change the the um, the gross numbers that that we see reflected in these tragedies. So I, I want to uh, I, I want to give each of you a chance for a closing statement, uh, if you'd like, uh, Professor Webster. Um, I guess I would just close in saying that um, you know it's my sincere hope that. Congress will act to make some of the reforms that were discussed today that really can achieve the objectives that truly the vast majority of Americans agree upon. And when I say that, I mean gun owners. Uh, virtually all of the kind of uh, common sense regulations that have been discussed in this hearing today, gun owners support. Uh, there may be extremist organizations that don't, but when you do polling, gun owners agree with it. So I, I hope that we can start to make progress on this. Uh, it is one of the largest public health problems that we face, and uh, the federal government needs to step up to the plate. To Professor Sorensen. Professor Webster said it well. And the piece that I would add is that there have been a number of organizations, um, groups of former battered women, and uh, those who advocate on behalf of them, who have worked hard to get those laws in place. And it's really important, I think, that we make sure that they are implemented and enforced uh, so that we can ensure safety and greater health. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Hunter. Well, I, I just want to express my gratitude that you're, that, uh, for your focus on broader issues around health care and access to quality health care, because I really think that's at the crux of, of this tragedy. Without in any way trying to trivialize the importance of the gun issue, it's been frankly a little frustrating to me the last couple of weeks that there's been so much focus on, on the gun issue with respect to Mr. Cho and no very few questions asked about, well, how could somebody like this have not gotten treatment? And the answer is, is because in many parts of the country there is no mental health system in place. And where there is a system, it's crisis oriented. So you only get services when you're in crisis and for only for so long as you are in crisis. Um, it would be akin to having a system for treatment of heart disease where you would only get treatment if you had a heart attack and then as soon as the immediate life-threatening event were averted, you wouldn't get any more treatment. So it's no wonder why so many people fall through the cracks. Um, and um, you know, you've certainly been over over the years a great champion for trying to uh, you know fix our health care ills in this country, and we really appreciate it. I, I thank the gentleman. Thank all the witnesses. Uh, certainly, the discussion that you've started today has uh, the potential to be the basis of other hearings uh, by the subcommittee. So this uh, staff will certainly. Uh, be in touch with you, and I'm grateful for the uh, professional commitment that each of you have shown to these issues. Uh, this has uh, been a hearing of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Uh, the hearing today has been about lethal loopholes, deficiencies in state and federal gun purchase laws. I'm Congressman Dennis Kucinich of Ohio, and uh, I'm the chairman of this committee. I want to thank all the witnesses for your participation and this committee stands adjourned. Good job. Now at cspan.org, order your C-SPAN 2007 Congressional Directory. Inside, House and Senate member biographies, as well as information on committees